Yo, what's going on, everybody? Okay, how's everybody doing? We are going to start the day off with centaur testing. No, not not no, not in Kerbal. In real life. In real life. Look, 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 look. Oh. Hey, Shortline. What's up, man? So yeah, guys. Sorry, sorry. A little little running a little behind schedule today, but we'll we'll get it going in a moment. Uh, I uh. I went and got the oil for the um, for the ninety seven. I can confirm that the drain pan gasket, the drain plug gasket, is absolutely leaking. Yeah, it's absolutely leaking. Um, good news is is that I do not see any oil coming out of the drain pan gasket. There is no oil coming out of that thing. It's it's all the drain plug drain uh, the drain plug gasket, which is cracked. I know it's cracked because I put it back in there and it wasn't leaking until a couple of days ago. So. I have a new gasket, a nylon gasket, and motor oil and an oil filter, and I figure during the garage stretch break, we'll belt out an oil change real quick. You got Twitch affiliate short line? That's what I'm talking about, dude. That's a Centaur and Delta 4 clothing. Dude, I, yeah, Vulcan is just takes all the best ideas from Delta and all the best ideas from Atlas and just makes it into one vehicle. That Centaur 5, man... I will be as so bold to say that one of these things riding inside of a forward load reactor on SLS would be very, very nice. SLS with Atlas V style fairing, vehicle staging adapter, and one of these bad boys. One of these bad boys in a forward load reactor. Now we're, see, yeah, yeah, you wish. Yeah. Yeah. SLS is Delta 5. I firmly 100% agree with you. Dude, look at that thing. White spray on foam insulation. And look at look at all the load sensors they have plugged into that thing. Look at the wire harness. The re so, who knows? Who wants to know? Why are there so many sensors right here? Anybody know? There's a really good reason for it. That's right. That's the common bulkhead on the Centaur. That's where the... Uh, Hydrogen oxygen bulkhead is hydrogen's up here locks is down low on a centaur common bulkhead is there. They're doing load testing Can crusher compression load testing Which is freaking sweet dude. Oh, that's so cool. Look at they put it into the load cell. Oh, that's All right. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I'm I'm dude. I'm peeping Tori Tori Bruno. I'm sorry. I'm peeping Okay, locks line, locks line, hydrogen line, hydrogen line. There's four of them because there's this is a dual engine Centaur. Centaur 5 is twin engine. And then you have the mounts for the uh, for the RCS right there too. Oh no, those are motor mounts. Those are the engine mounts. See right there? That's the gimbal mount for the twin RL10s right there. Man, this is, this is not, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Hold up a second here. No. No, no. No. Ah, what's this over here and that over there? Those aren't the locks lines. Nope. Right there. Interesting. Hey, Daz, what's going on? How you doing? But EJ, leaf peeping ended... About two weeks ago. I'm centaur peeping or something. So I'm wondering what these lines are for. Got them. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. That must be the that must be a fill and drain. That must be the fill and drain, if I had to guess. I'm not sure what that one's for. The, these are these are coming out in the center, so that's gotta be a downcomer. So those gotta be hydrogen. But that would make locks right here. And see how they have low points in the tank? They have these two lobe pieces coming out. That means that that's locks because the locks tank is low. So locks is over there, locks is over there. And then two hydrogen and then it must be a fill and drain. But if we back out a little bit, there's your... Ah, locks fill is right there. That must be a LH2. LH2 fill and drain. So that's that's the that's the gas line where they where they fuel it up. That goes to an engine, that goes to an engine, that goes to an engine, that goes to an engine. And then the locks fill is right there, hydrogen fill is right there. And then 
your RL10 mounts are right there and right there, and it's all strutted. No, vents vents are on the bot or on the top of the tank, Supervod. The one on the right has a wrench on it. What? Is this the bottom end of SLS? No, failures. This is the bottom of Centaur 5. This is Vulcan's upper stage. It's a 5 meter Centaur with twin RL10s on it. This is a load testing article here. Uh, they're doing a compression load analysis on this thing. Uh, we know it's compression load because they're putting it into the can crusher. This is a big load cell right here. Load cell test stand. They're going to crush that thing. Or at least smush it a little bit. Yeah, interesting. Interdasting. Yeah, vent lines would be up on the top. But if you look, they got they got DFI sensors all over this thing. And they're all over the bulkhead. See that? I'll bet you they go around the entire rim of the bulkhead right there. And then there's there's more DFI sensors on the developmental flight instrumentation. There's more DFI sensors on the forward and aft skirts of this Centaur. Man, that thing's good. Dude, that's going to be a great, great upper stage. I kind of low-key want one of those on Falcon Heavy. Is that bad? Put a Centaur 5 on top of Falcon Heavy instead of Falcon 9 second stage? Kind of low-key want that. Don't tell nobody. Is it going to be filled with inert gas to pressurize so no hydrogen booms yeah they te they test with the tanks inerted we they use nitrogen nitrogen isn't exactly like hydrogen but it's close enough and it's inert and non-reactive because boom because boom mm -hmm. have you been following cursed rockets on twitter Yes. <sighs> yes. Also. 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 Every rocket should be first stage plus Centaur 5. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Yeah, Josh, I'm kind of with you on that one. Nitrogen is like hydrogen the same way that water is like gasoline. Oh well, oh well. If if they're not if they're not similar, you should just use hydrogen for all your tank test tank pressurization tests. Tessa, you clearly know more. Oh wait, no, you don't. <laughs> it's kind of funny actually. ULA gave us some slow mo shots from JPSS. That's see, that's a Centaur three right there. That's a little boy Centaur. Hey, Chief. Also, frick you for your Twitter comment. You can kiss my ass. <laughs> okay, hear me out in S4B. Sorry. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> what? Twitter's dead already. Do you guys remember when Call of Duty came out? Call of Duty Modern Warfare... I think it's Modern Warfare 2. Not this one. The one that came out like 10 years ago. Do you guys remember when that came out? And everybody wanted to boycott it because it had some DLC or something in it. And everybody wanted to boycott it. And everyone said they were boycotting it. And everyone said Call of Duty, the Call of Duty franchise is dead. And then the day after it came out, like they, they even formed Steam groups to boycott the new Call of Duty because it's a waste of money. It's a waste of time. The game's going to suck. And then... Somebody checked the Steam group the day after the game came out, and the entire Call of Duty boycotting group is all playing Call of Duty. And they said how the franchise did. You guys remember that? You guys remember that? I don't know. I don't know. I just thought that relevant to bring it up. Sile. It seems, it seems relevant. No, I was seven. Well, get older. Jeez. 
Yeah, Throffy. Yeah, I don't know, man. I'm not gonna sit here. Like, I'm not trying to make this about one thing or another. But, you know what? Uh, for as much crap as I give Twitter, Twitter's damn addicting. And you gotta be careful. It's damn addicting. I'm not sure that I am strong enough to be able to kick that habit. Plus, the space news on Twitter is fantastic. Yeah. You, get, you get really good shots like what I just showed you. That's the reason why I'm on Twitter at all. I'm sure Pepperidge Farm remembers. I saw a comment on people leaving Twitter that I found funny. Twitter is not an airport. You don't have to announce your departure. Ugh. Yeah, the Space News is fantastic, Obsidian. That's what keeps me coming back. That and it's a really good way to to make connections with people. I've 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 made connection. I've made many a connections with people in the industry through Twitter. I'm not even kidding. Just shoot people a DM. Yo, what up? And they're like, oh, you're that guy that streams Kerbal. I'm like, yes, I am that guy that streams Kerbal. <laughs> yes, that's me. <laughs> Follow me. Like and subscribe to this video. Wait, what? Oh, also, update on normieing. Uh, I did go and wa and hang out with my neighbor. Uh, he's a good dude. Uh, get a bunch of, bunch of people over and lots of beer was drank. And your boy... Uh, Your, your boy drank a lot. <laughs> Good times had by all. We watched the Bruins. The Bruins kicked the trash out of the Flyers. Yeah, so, yeah. Good times had by all. So, just wanted to let you know that you guys told me to do normie things yesterday, so. Hey, Shotch. I know that guy. Uh, and I did do normie things yesterday. What do you think about making a spin launcher in KSP? Totally doable, Tweets. Kraken, you'd need hybrid tech to do it, but it's doable if you wanted to reuse the thing because you'd use it once and it would break. Mainstream media is screwing up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> dude. Oh my god. I, I'm not, dude, I'm not even mad. I'm not even... I ain't even mad. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even mad. That's really funny. <laughs> Actual cursed rocket images. No way. <laughs> I love it. Yep, source NASA. I doubt that very much. Source NASA, they put that. In there. Oh my god. Source NASA. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, man, that's great. Look to the right, it gets worse. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> you know what, man? I'm not even going to let that bother me. God dang, that's funny. <laughs> oh, my God. You know, that, you know what? You know what, man? Is it bad that I take solace in the fact that that reads correctly? How messed up does it actually have to be where I see that and I'm like, yep. Yeah, that day. Hey, that's normal. That's fine. Hey, man, you, you know what? You know what? You can say whatever you want. You can get mad at this all you want. But them screwing up is why I have a job. So, frick them. Keep making mistakes, bros. That's fine with me. <laughs> Damn, that's funny. <laughs> that, I'm genu that genuinely put me in a good mood. That's really funny. All right. First flight centaur. Ooh, it makes me feel makes you feel smarter too. Uh, you know, that's all fine with wanting to wanting to learn. You know what I'm saying? But make sure you don't go rocket Karen on people. You know what I'm saying? Remember, people are always curious about space. It does provoke the mind in ways that you don't know. Don't be a dick about it. I practice what I preach on here every day. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, no, yes, it's great. Oh, it's, that's great for me. Yo, please, please keep making mistakes. It's fantastic. I'm not even outraged. Yeah, keep doing that. 
<laughs> keep please keep doing that because then people will find this stream and then I can teach them how it actually works. It's great. That's that's money for me, man. It's perfect. I ain't laughing all the way to the bank, dude. <laughs> all right, what other links did you guys want to see? I apologize for idiotic British hyperbole news. Use the BBC, not Sky. Tessa, I don't watch Sky, but sometimes we get the Sky feed over here for Formula One, and if the Sky feed is indicative of the station, Crofty, yeah, I don't need to watch Sky, ever. Yeah. Yep. This is a picture from Nathan Barker over at NASA Space Flight. That, uh... Whew. That's, uh, that, that's, um... That's, a uh, very nice. There was a Soyuz mission that came in like that. Yeah. <laughs> There's a fake live stream claiming this is a live view of Orion from the moon. Man, people will do anything for some of that internet clout, huh? How many people are watching this stream? Oof. Cringe, Basil. Cringe. Yep, yep, doesn't, yep, okay, yep, yep. Curiosity is not related to pre-existing knowledge, but you know what I like more than knowledge is this new Lamborghini here. Oh, hi, Centaur. Oh, hi, Centaur. What's new with you? How's your Centaur life? That is a nice... Hey. Nice stage. Oh, man. Dude, this picture makes me... This picture makes me feel things that... Th Dude, you can feel the heat coming off of this picture. This picture's hot. This picture's hot. So stop melting, ladies, because this rocket's hotter than hot. It's hot, hot, hot! That doll. Oh, that's hot. I'm pretty sure it's, it is actually really warm. Like, in my expert scientific opinion, I'm actually pretty sure it's really warm, like, right in this area. I'm pretty sure that's at least 100 degrees. At least. At least a hundred degrees. Not not here. See, that's water. Water is cold. Not here. That's that's just there. or here so much. But like right here, that's at least a hundred, maybe a hundred million degrees. Kelvin grade. Kel Nash Kelvinator. <clears throat> I think Nash Kelvinator made coffee machines and 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 cars, but coffee machines. It's warm. Source, NASA. <laughs> Source, NASA. I love it. I love it. That's so good. Did you see the Hermes Ramjet test fire? I did. I did. I did. At least 100 degrees Calvin and Hobbes scale. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe like three kilofeet in degrees measurement, Newton meters. Water can be warm. Zach. That's what they want you to think, okay? That's what they want you to think. That's what they want you to think. They're lying to you. No. Um, all right. So this is, okay. <laughs> Jokes aside, this is right after booster ignition. So yeah, the SRB, the SRB temperatures are, so inside of the SRBs, okay. So this is the nerd part. This, this is the not funny part, but it's still pretty freaking cool. So the SRBs burn hydroxyl terminated polybutadiene and ammonium perchlorate with an aluminum powder flake stabilizer to make sure that the explosion is nice and uniform. Uh, yes, it burns metal. It's so metal, it burns metal. Um, yeah, that that's... I'm not sure exactly. I know this burns hotter than thermite. Uh, like way hotter than thermite. And thermite is pretty damn hot. They use it to weld like railroad tracks together. This this would this would only not only weld the railroad track together, there would be no railroad track left. He just made up some words. Uh, long story short, like it's like it's it's pretty freaking warm. Um, it's an interesting contrast because it's like 
I don't know, probably like 1600C. That's that's just a that's just a ballpark guess. And that nozzle doesn't doesn't break. Uh, the, how they can handle the temperature, believe it or not, is the nozzles on these SRBs are ablative. The nozzle is made out of heat shield. They use they use thermal ablation on the inside of the nozzle. The nozzle literally melts over time, and the nozzle melting releases it burns cold, and it gives you film insulation on the inside. It gives you a film of colder gas on the inside that shields the rocket from the crazy heat, but it still burns off. Burns metal and spews liquid salts. Yeah, something like that, dude. Hey, Arun, what's going on? It's cold er gas. Cold er gas. Like, yeah. It does the same thing that supersonic retropropulsion does. It's the same thing to protect Falcon 9, but it's with a nozzle. Contrast that to the RS-25E engines, which actually flow hydrogen through the nozzle. They flow hydrogen through the nozzle to keep the nozzle cold. Hydrogen in liquid form is, in fact, very freaking cold. Yeah, very cold. Yeah, like almost zero Kelvin. Yeah. Kelvinator are now Swedish, and they make fridges. Yeah, fridges. Fridges are cold, Tessa. If I go for an MBA, is an online MBA good or not? I think that really kind of matters where it comes from, dude. See last. No. All right, cool. What's up? Question, and I hope it's not dumb. I know they use water for sound suppression, but does it actually provide any thermal protection to anything? Yeah. Yeah, of course. That's the difference between a sound suppressor, alleviate, and a pad deluge. Pad deluge systems do the same thing as the, the ablator nozzle, but with water. And it, it prevents the flame trench from getting, like, raw-dogged, if you catch my drift, if you're picking up what I'm laying down. Like, you... <laughs> They learned from the Apollo program why you really want to protect your flame trench because it turns out when you put 8 million pounds of thrust of like hot gases through the flame trench, it messes it up. Yeah. Yeah. That's what a pad deluge system does. Sound suppressors are above the pad deck. So see these, these rainbirds right here? Those are a sound suppressor. That is preventing sounds from the rocket from reverbing off of the deck of the launch pad and destroying the rocket on the way up. The vibrations, it's a compounding frequency, right? So the SRBs get so loud, they reverb, and uh, it can actually shake the rocket to pieces. And they really got to be careful with that, because SRBs, the vibrations that they give off are very... They're not high frequency, but they do... They What's the vibrations that they give off? I forget. It, 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 it a lot. It's a lot. It's... It's not a high frequency. It's not low frequency. It's like it, it is. It's like right in the center. If I get, I forget what the I forget what the resonant hertz is for that thing, for those things. They they they, they vibrate a lot, and th that can reverb off the pad. And it like you ever been in a squash court? How you could say something and it's a lot louder. Literally that. High amplitude. Yeah, high amplitude, medium frequency. If I'm remembering right, how did they learn that? Well, um, so if you have ever seen a picture of a Saturn V taking off from the pad from a little ways away, uh, yeah, here, here's a good picture. Here's a good picture of Saturn V, like, absolutely destroying the pad that it took off from. It's bad if you have flames literally coming out of the flame trench. They figured out that a deflector was not enough. You really got to you really got to spray this thing down and if you spray this down instead of the pad absorbing the heat and melting you have water absorb all the heat cuz water is very conductive of heat. It's you it's very conductive of heat. It's like mag heat heat to water is like a magnet. No, the rocket didn't go boom, but the flame trench the flame trench did <laughs> Yeah, it gets a little messed up. I'm trying to find the time when Orion will enter the moon's SOI, but can't find it. It's going to be on Sunday night, Squishion. Yeah. So, like, that's what I mean when I say you're raw-dogging the pad. There's literally flames shooting out of the pad. Now, you see, the, you see the flames coming out of this pad right here, and you're like, wow, that's a lot of flames. But if you compare that to the ML, the ML deck is, like, four or five stories off the ground. That flame is huge coming out of there. 
huge. So that that's the other reason. That's what a deluge system does. It 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 protects the pad, but also some rockets have a sound suppressor at the end of the flame trench. Sound suppressors at the end of the flame trench are there to also suppress the sound so it's not as loud. Uh but so it's like kind of interesting because you can have a deluge at the top of the pad, like on the launch deck, right? And, or you could have a sound suppressor up on the top of the pad and then you have the deluge system underneath it, right? And then in some rocket designs at the end of the flame trench, there's another suppressor. Like uh, Slick 41 and Slick 40 have a sound suppressor at the end of the flame trench. Yeah, exactly. You know, SpaceX has one at pad 40, Sean. Yep, yep. Show pictures of the trench post-launch. Uh, I don't have here. I don't have any pictures of, I don't think I have a picture offhand of the, of the trench per se, but I can here, let me look through. So 39B has a brand new flame deflector in it. They, they basically restored the entire pad back to Apollo spec, but with modern upgrades that's the deflector inside of 39. You could see the pad deluge is right there on the flame deflector. See it? See those little the nubs that are at the top? Those shoot out water as well. Um, the Zach, I've walked basically right where this picture was taken. Um, the, the width here is about the size of an eight-lane highway. And see, they went with this kind of... It looks like chain mail almost on the flame deflector. In the past, the flame deflectors were literally just concrete. They had a metal tray that's shaped like a quarter pipe, right? And they just cast concrete onto that metal tray. But I know for a fact that that wasn't working very well because it literally melts the tray. The, the rocket exhaust is enough to melt concrete. Um, I'm going to see if... See if we have pictures of a, of a used deflector. Oh, there's there's kind of part of it. Here, I'll show you. So, look. That's what it does to concrete. That's the old flame deflector when they refurbished 39B. Also, furred. See? Look at it. It's abrasive. It's like sandblasting concrete, only at really high temperature. It, it'll melt. It melts concrete. That's enough. That's why they went with that scales deflector. See, look. I mean, look at it. It's so damn abrasive, it'll, it'll, it's basically like pressure washing the flame deflector. Apollo spec. That's what it looked like during the shuttle and during the Apollo program, yeah. Now, the way Apollo was going to get around that idea was they were, they were going to have a swappable flame deflector. If you notice, there's a little, see that little stripe right there on the, on this thing? The little stripe is the, was a rail, a rail system. And the deflectors actually were able to be swapped out and refurbished. So they, but they figured out sometime after the Apollo program into the shuttle program that you didn't, you didn't really need to. You could spray water on the pad and it'd be okay. But if you look at 39B and 39A, they both have it. See the stripes right there, and you could see it's a switch. And they could have, they could store another deflector right here for refurbishment and, you know, take the spent one out, put the refurbed one in, right? And then when that one's junk, you move that one out and then you move the other one back in. You could just swap them back and forth. You take the spent one and you just refurb it over here. That's what, that's what that's for. They could swap the deflectors out because they just said, all right, fine. The deflector will ablate over time, but the rest of the pad will be fine. And then during the shuttle program, they figured out that if you spray the pad with a ton of water, see the water tower right there? You spray the pad with a ton of water, you don't need to swap these as much. So what they did was they scrapped the second one and then they took one of them and literally just parked it. They just parked it right there and then they just welded it in place. And that's what you saw being destroyed in this picture. That's an original flame deflector from the Apollo program. But on the corners here, you can see what that does. It, it absolutely destroys concrete. It'll destroy concrete, bricks, whatever. The The walls of the flame trench are actually like, uh, they actually are bricks, but they're like kind of, the kind of bricks that you'd find in a kiln. They're like uh, beige looking bricks. I forget what they are, but yeah, see? 
then they constructed a new deflector and they redid all the walls for SLS. Now, who knows what SLS did to this thing? I'll bet you it's wrecked. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, see, it's these color bricks. They're like beige. I don't know what those, what types of bricks those are, but that's the refurbed flame deflector. But yeah, you see, it came equipped with a pad deluge attached to it. And they redid all the bricks and stuff. And it, dude, it looks great. It looks really nice. That's that's really nice. It, don't worry about it. If it rusts, it's okay. It's that'll protect it. Believe it or not. Surface oxidization like this on steel actually protects protects the steel. It seals the steel in an iron oxide layer, and it actually keeps it super super. It won't it won't rust anymore. Once once all the surface that's exposed to oxygen hits iron oxide. If oxygen hits iron oxide, it doesn't do anything. So, yeah. It's probably very... I'll bet you... I'll bet you it's really clean right now. They, uh... Yeah, it's probably really clean. The rocket engine probably sandblasted all the rust off of this thing. Well, water... Actually, it would be water blasting. Pressure washing. Because the exhaust from the shuttle engines is water. So, I'll bet you it's clean. <laughs> I'll bet you it's back to bare metal. But see, this thing is easier to swap parts out. But dude, that that steel is, that steel's like two to three inches thick. It is thick boy steel. It's called an oxidization barrier. You're an oxidization barrier. Now drop in with a skateboard. Mm, yeah, I'm, no, I'm no, I'm good. I don't I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Exactly, failures. The rust, rust will be gone. But yeah, see, these are the type of bricks that are in like a kiln right there. See that? They're they're actually really good. But those were getting blown out too. the The pads do need to be refurbished either way over time. It's, I mean, guys, the, the what comes out of the bottom of these rocket engines is something akin to a nuclear blast. Like, I mean, you saw the pressure wave come out of SLS when the SRBs ignited. It left a huge thermobaric like. Uh, shock wave coming out of the coming out of the flame trench. Do you know the type of steel? I don't, Jeb. To be honest, no. I'll bet you. I'll bet you it is. If I had to guess, this is just an educated guess. I I have no idea. I know it's thick steel. I'll bet you it's na It's like uh, the same type of steel that they use to make ships. Like navy grade steel. That's not what it's called. Uh, I'll bet you it's something like that. Because if you think about it, think of where the pad is. The pad's right next to the water. So I'll bet you it's like marine marine grade. That's what it's. That I don't even know if that's a thing. I'll bet you it's a similar similar steel composition to like an aircraft carrier or something. Is the oil pan leak fixed now? It's not. But I have oil. Uh, you can't see it. It's off the screen. It's not, but I have the oil. Uh, it is definitely the drain plug. The drain plug gasket is toast. Um, yeah. I know because we, we hit, JD, we hit that thing with uh, a bunch of a bunch of engine degreaser. And don't get me wrong, all, the engine degreaser did uh, end up dripping onto the, onto the floor, right? But there is oil there, and the drain plug, yeah, I... I'll show it to you guys. It's pretty obvious. The there is no oil coming out of those two bolts that we put in, though. So that's good. But yeah, I I got a new drain plug gasket. It's a nylon gasket, which seems to be what's on there already. It might not fit. It might fit. We'll find a way to make it work. But yeah, I gotta get the ninety seven out <laughs> because uh, I gotta change the oil on all the other cars, and I gotta change the oil on the car that Bremo and I are driving to Detroit next week. So, yeah, it's going to be fun. You should do a stream segment video where you break down the full Artemis plan. All right. All this makes me wonder how SpaceX plans to maintain super heavy pads in the long term. No flame deflector, Admiral. They are going with what's called a milk stool approach. Um... So, 
during the Apollo program, they wanted to, NASA wanted to operate all their rockets out of Complex 39, so what they ended up doing is taking the Saturn 1B, which was designed for 37, Complex 37 and 34, and adapting a mobile launcher to launch it. You do not need to worry about refurbishing the flame trench if you don't have a flame trench. Does that look familiar? What does that look like? Hey, human. What days are you going on vacation? I'm out on Wednesday, so next next week, Anesthesist, I'm streaming uh, Monday, Tuesday. And then we're out on Wednesday morning. Yep, best part is no part. Does that sound familiar? It's that they NASA called this thing the milk stool. They basically took out the Saturn five umbilicals here for the first stage discovery go at throttle up. and then basically on the reinforced part where the saturn V was supposed to stand they built this truss structure and then took um took a saturn 1b's launch frame from pad 37 the design not the actual one and they bolted it on top what does that look like to you See what I mean? If you put the rocket high enough off the ground, you don't need to worry about it. If you put up, if you put it up high enough off the ground and deliver enough water, it shouldn't be a big deal. I wonder if SpaceX could land a Starship on the Boca Chica Beach as an unprepared landing pad test. They won't let them land there. They, they, they have to. It, ha it would have to be right here, S. They wouldn't let them land on in the RGV uh, National Park. Tactical 18 months, and then Jimmy with a 10 monther. Thank you. How tall is that starship stool? Well, count the flights of stairs. Uh, so those are half flights. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven stories. That's about 70 feet. Uh, so seven story building. So what's that in meters? Um, yeah. 23 and a half meters off the ground. But the Boca pad what spray a lot of water so it's going to get wrecked. They'll... <laughs> Thomas, I will tell you right now, and it's not because I know better, but because I know basic physics, they'll, they'll give it a water tower eventually. Or some nitrogen water supply system or something. If you spray it with enough water, it'll be fine. You could just, because the, the problem here is not necessarily the pressure shift. I mean, the pressure shift when the rockets go off is going to cause some issues, right? But it's the heat. The heat is what ruins the pad. The heat, the heat will destroy that thing. If you give the heat an avenue to, to, to burn off, right? Like water, then it, it won't be as bad. And like I said, that's what NASA figured out. That's why 39A and 39B were equipped with these gigantic honking water towers. I generally un always underestimate how massive some of this stuff is. I want to see it in person. It's big, dude. She's big, Jax. Yeah, like I said, thirty th that flame trench, dude, I've walked right here. Right where my mouse cursor is. I've walked up in here and peered into it. It's huge. It, bigger than you think. It's bigger than you think it is. It's absolutely gigantic. I'm telling you, it's as wide as an eight-lane highway. This whole pad complex is monstrous. If you ever take the the KSCVC tour, you could see these you could see this stuff up close, and it's just like, ah, oh, do they use seawater or fresh water? I would be using fresh water, Cyberlink. Yeah, not necessarily potable, but yeah, I wouldn't want to spray my pad with salt water. That's probably not good, especially when the rocket goes off. Salt does weird things when you heat it up. Just, just saying. All right, so let's go in here. Orbital launch tower cladding. Ooh, oh, very nice, very nice. Yeah, look at that. Which, which one is that? Uh, that's at Boca Chica. Okay, cool.
All right. We are going down here. We're going down here to shuttle block one. This is what we want. I figured out that image with the parachutes attached to the bottom of the... Yes, that was definitely a concept about how NASA will reuse the service module. I figured out that image with the parachutes attached to the bottom of the ESM is definitely a concept about how NASA will reuse the service module. Uh, interesting. I, I don't, uh, there, I mean, parachutes are all fine and dandy, but you, there's this thing called the re-entry, Cody. I don't know how the service module will survive that re-entry without a heat shield. Alright, so. Lofted? An inflatable? Uh, I don't know, man. So what I want to work on today is building out payload base solutions here and getting the robotic arm all working here. That's what I want to get done. Um, but I think we should first start the day with... We'll start the day with the shuttle. We'll, we'll get the shuttle up there. And we'll get it up there and we'll bring her back down. Or we'll just check the ascent. I just want to make sure that everything here is working correctly. Any payload? I think I left... Uh, nope, no payload in there. Last time we did it, uh, we, we did a 9-ton. I did a 9-ton payload up and down, and honestly, with 9 tons of payload in it, I had to shim it with the body flap and the speed brake during re-entry a little bit. But the vehicle handled basically the same. Like, it was a little bit different, but not as much as you might think. Because shuttle is literally genius. Why a shuttle where you can have Ares 1? I actually... Jax, I said I wanted to use Jebstone 4, which is my Ares 1-esque lifter. And I wanted to build a pod for it. And then I just said, you know what? Screw it. Let's just use the shuttle. Let's use the shuttle and... The shuttle and the uh, SLS-ish lifter. Are you going to do something like... Pam S or IUS or Centaur G Prime. Centaur G is what I want, Spaceophobic. Pam S is okay. IUS is a pretty good two-stage upper two-stage upper stage solution. Centaur G. Centaur G. Shuttle should have flown with that. I mean, it's interesting because we were listening to the Lofted press conference yesterday, and they were talking about using inflatable heat shields to bring Cygnus back down. You know, you could bring Cygnus back down. You could even bring ISS modules back down with the right, the right attachment, which is just bananas to me. Seriously, though, flying Ares one with a shuttle was a nice idea. It could have been executed better, but I like the thinking. If I need so, Jax, I chose not to do the pod now because we're going to be operating mostly in low Earth orbit, and I say low Earth orbit just. I, when I say low Earth orbit, I mean Kerbal, but yeah, I don't, I call it just what it's called in real life, but you get the idea. Um, I don't really need a pod for LEO operations. When we go further out into space, it's probably going to be for the better. I'll probably have one as a lifeboat solution, just in case. But, uh, yeah. Mostly in LKU, LKO. Haven't you been doing that for the past six years? When deep space? Hmm. How long did it take me to make this shuttle comparatively to the last one? Yeah, don't worry, it's coming. Don't get your, don't get your freaking underwear in a bunch, man. It's coming. It took me six months to make CTSNG. It took me a week to make this. Trust me, it's coming. Is this shuttle named Pathfinder? I haven't really developed orbiter names yet, but uh, we'll work on it.
plop, plop a puddle, uh, drop. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Pig zig, that's a hard. Try to say that sentence three times fast. Plop a pod into the payload bay for for beyond low carbon orbit operations. Kind of like early lunar access program. We're going to use transfer vehicles for now, yep. And it looks way better. Yeah. He's a nice vehicle. So let's just go and make sure that everything is working here. We don't I don't have any payload in the payload bay. We'll fly we'll fly dry today. Give me one second, dude. Tricks of the trade, man. But don't worry, we'll go further. It's happening. Range does not go for launch, sorry. Oh. Wait a minute. I am the range. Let me just double check the sound okay headphone users head headphone users just in case t minus 10 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 we got ignition and liftoff all right Starting today with a nice early shuttle mission. We are go for roll program. Roll program is complete. Roger roll. Yeah, goalie, the real one does that, dude. I'm serious. Real shuttle actually does that. Okay, we're throttling the engines back for maximum dynamic pressure. All systems looking good. No burbs were injured on this launch. Yep. Actually, the funny thing is, is that the auto sequencer has a, basically there's an accelerometer in here that if the thwang doesn't happen correctly, so like if T minus zero comes around and the shuttle isn't pointed straight up, It'll, sh it'll say no. It'll scrub the launch. Straight, yeah. Seriously. Because if the vehicle is pointing this way and you light the engines, it's just going to nose over into the ground. The shuttle, the shuttle auto sequencer has to, has to register that the vehicle is pointing straight up. So you get a, just a slight translation when you leave the pad. Because if it's over here like this and you go to fire it, it's just going to not work. Okay, go at throttle up. Copy, go at throttle up. Did you hear about John Krause on Twitter? His account got locked after one video of SLS. Tim did a nice post on it. I did hear about it, yeah. I don't understand what's going on. We should free John Krause. Hashtag. That's what the kids do, right? Okay. Everything's looking good. Cross tailing off, SRB standing by for separ separation in the next 15 seconds.
Good separation. Nominal first stage performance. Lofted on this trajectory, <clears throat> on this trajectory this morning. That's okay. We can correct. Have you seen the methane plume that you can set the vector to? It looks like Raptor. Cool. No, I haven't. I'm just really happy with this going on here. That looks really nice. It, it looks very similar to the to the shuttle. Okay, we are two engine Tal. up position for acquisition through Tedris. Uh, we have the fruits of that lofted trajectory here. Just kind of burn it down a little bit. That's just a slight course correction for me. Okay. That's good. Stand by, press for Miko. Okay, we have Miko confirmed. Perigee went a little high there. We just gotta make it we make it so the external tank gets destroyed. There we go. No space junk. There we go. Alright, stand by for separation. One not required here. The rates on the damn controllers are a little messed up. There we go. Cool. Okay. Ohms one in three minutes. Or ohms two. What's Miko mean? M E C O, main engine cutoff. The shuttle has main engines, and yeah, we have main engine cutoff. Yeah, that's when the main engines shut down. Okay, we got a good acquisition on both boosters. Oh boy. Parachutes aren't opening. Yeah, the drug shoot didn't go. I think we need two drogue shoots on this thing. I would have had both boosters if we had if the drogue shoots had deployed uh, for a little bit longer. 
Yeah, th those we need more drugs. I was trying to get Principia to play with nice with KSP, but it's not the best. Hey, Farb, 26 month resub. Thank you. I wish there was a Principia light that didn't derail all the planets. Is that thing that you did to modify the SRB gimbal in the VOD? I want to see if I can go try it. Just find in the, in the craft file, dude. In the craft file, just find... Um, Air brakes? No, 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 no. We need the drug shoots are our air brakes. We just need more drugs. I think the real ones had more than one drug shoot. Um, yeah, Jax, just go into the craft file and then find the SRB. Just <clears throat> type Clydesdale, Control F Clydesdale, and then find the gimbal field. Change it from 100 to 800. It's really no harder than that. Okay, we're good for ohms too here. Yeah. Stand by for ohms two burn. Showing good ohms two here. Desert landing? Uh, I don't really have the right approach for that wheat. Hey Cloud. Air brakes are better than drogue shoots. Uh, I disagree, It's it's application. It's really more about application than anything. Okay. 94 by 95. I'm just going to shore that up with the RCS here. There we go. Okay, we're go for on orbit. Stand by for payload bay door open. Go down in here, make sure that the fuel cells are working. Three onboard fuel cells are working. Good. Okay. Cool. How big are the fuel cells on the shuttle? Not the size of an engine block. Payload bay lights are on. Okay. Let's just give her a quick boost here. Okay, we are 100 circular. Sweet. Nice 100 by 100 orbit, we shut the RCS, and then increase the wheel authority slight to five. There we go. All right, cool. <clears throat> now, this is where we would, you know, deploy the, the arm, et cetera, et cetera. That's what we're gonna work on today. I just wanted to make sure that this was still working as intended. Everything seems to be okay. Slip the deploy angle there. Lock that down. Okay, that's the that's the mount pieces for the external tank. Wow, that big I thought they would be micro size. It's a fuel cell. It's designed it's a little power plant team, man. They're yeah, they're they're big. Hey Wicked, what's going on?
Bring the tunage. Okay, we're just gonna do one orbit, then we'll swing around here. Give me a 60 meters a second burn here and we'll get this sucker through re-entry and back to the runway. You missed the rent -a pie days? What, like this? Make sure you rent your pies. And tip your waitress. Nah, I can't do that, Sala, sorry. Okay. Go for payload bay door close. Okay, good deorbit burn. Shutting down orbiter maneuvering engines. And we are preparing the vehicle for entry interface. Consider robotic parts to add extra gimbal to your engine so they're not skewed once you're up there. Well, that's basically how the shuttle had them, dude. These are in pretty damn close to the actual positions. Um, I've tried using robotics to make gimbal before. It kind of, kind of works. We'd have to, it would have to be hybrid tech to be strong enough, but, I mean, I've thought about it, but when I tried it, dude, it didn't work. Why do you use the Terrier as your Ohms engine when there is one modeled after the real shuttle OMS? It's modeled after it, but it doesn't work like it. That's why. Real shuttle uses liquid fuel and oxidizer. It's not a monopropellant engine. It's a monomethylhydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide motor. Uh... So, yeah, it's not realistic in function to the actual one. These are more in line with how the AJ-10 actually functions. Robotics is still kind of buggy. Nah, I've figured out most of the kinks, dude. Lots of testing. 
Okay, bring up the body flap controls. And air brake controls. It works with one, RJ. I can operate off single ohms, yes. Well, we got we got the next best thing the other day, man, and it did make me happy. I'll tell you that. Yeah, Solace. From what I from the people that I've talked to, I've heard they're pretty good. Pull Earth picture from Orion. This was late last night. That's from Orion Star Tracker, T man. Notice how Earth is grayed out. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, Roth. Dude, I would have preferred this to be the shuttle, but if I can't have the shuttle, I'll take SLS. That's fine. Those SRBs are bright, huh? BB Merck, why is it going to take so long for Artemis to get to the moon? Lower energy transfer. It's a lower energy transfer. It takes about a week. If we had a better upper stage for SLS Merck, it would take three days. But this is one of my big criticisms of the rocket. They, they, they're they basically put a Delta IV upper stage on it, stretched it a little bit, and then put it on SLS and called it a you know, moon stage. It's only really good at, it's really the only, it's only good at delivering the capsule out there. That's it. We had a bigger upper stage and a better upper stage for SLS, which they are, NASA's building it right now. The plan was to start small and then build up bigger, which that's like saying I'm going to make a car and build half of it and I'll figure out the other half later, which is interesting. Um, well, we could get to the moon faster. It's that dinky upper stage. The ICPS is a great stage, but it's a great stage for Delta Four. Not SLS. They're working on a stage that's a little bit bigger. It packs a little more of a punch. It's called um, the Exploration Upper Stage. Here, I, I can show you real quick. The EUS is massive. It, it is big, and it, they are working on it right now. There it is comparatively to the Saturn V third stage. Which is good. It's it's big. It's gonna be. This thing should fly first on Artemis Four. Uh, but yeah, see, look at that thing. That's a great render. It, it is a monster. This part right here. See that guy? That part right there is as big as the ICPS. This is a absolute unit of an upper stage, and it's got four engines. I mean, those are four RL tens. They're not. Not as efficient, but there that's what we use to send this Orion to the moon. That's the ICPS right there. And that's it with the EUS. Look at the difference. The capsule is the same size between those pictures. See what I'm talking about? The EUS also affords us a payload bay for, oh, I don't know, a lander. Because, you know, landing on the moon, kind of you kind of need that. Don't get me wrong. They're not using that for landers, not yet at least. Um... They're not using that for landers just yet. Uh, the first lunar landings will be with Starship, so you don't necessarily need anything in here. But NASA actually the other day decided that the EUS with a gateway component and Orion will go meet Lunar Starship out there on the Artemis 4 mission. The Artemis 4 mission is going to be one of the most complicated missions that NASA has ever, ever done. And it should be happening like 2025, 2026. 
uh, it is going to be ridiculous because it's going to have that big upper stage. It's going to have an exploration, uh, uh, a gateway module in here. So it's going to have a space station, a lunar space station module and Orion. Orion's going to pluck the space station module off, attach it to gateway and then attach to starship and then land. It's going to be a complicated mission, but it's going to carry a space station module like that. See? It's really good, man. The EUS is really good. Personally, I think SLS should have had this from the start. I, I It doesn't really make a lot of sense in my mind to not build the whole vehicle integrated from the start. But they did that in the name of some stupid... Some moron bureaucrat thought that that would save us money, which is... I, I, I don't get it either. But yeah, they, we should have started with this one. The Block 1B crew and cargo. That We should have baselined with that, not not this over here. It would have taken the same amount of time, to be 100% honest with you. Because, you know, they said, oh, this, the IUS, or the ICPS is off the shelf, right? It's just a Delta IV stage. It's not just a Delta IV stage. They modified it. They modified it. They redesigned the stage. This thing will not bolt onto a Delta IV if it, if it, even if they wanted to. It won't do it. It's a bigger... It's a stretched version. I suppose it'll probably still do that, but whatever. But yeah, that's the reason why it's taking so long, dude. Yeah, I find it really funny when NASA's stated goal is to for the betterment of scientific understanding and people like to put a price on scientific understanding. I think that's kind of dumb, don't you think? My money is that it was out of fear, Rule 8. If the new administration didn't show the previous ambition for space flight, then the smaller option may have been more appropriate. I don't know, though. Uh, Doc, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, it really came out basically... You know, and I don't want to talk about it. Long story short, it was a disagreement between the branches of government on what NASA should be doing. Um, and they said it was too expensive. Uh, and the reality is, is that, you know, when you have one of the branches of government not on board with spaceflight, it's really hard to get stuff done. And they, they made a, basically a rookie mistake. <laughs> a rookie mistake, in my opinion. You don't, uh, anytime somebody comes at you, and there's only one time where this has actually worked. Anytime someone says, oh, why are we doing this? We could do this and be doing it better. It's usually not a better solution. Case in point is literally the vehicle that you see on your screen. Why are we using the Saturn V? The space shuttle can do it better. Oh yeah? Where's the flags that were planted on the moon from the space shuttle? The only time that someone has bucked that trend is SpaceX. That's the only time. It's never, otherwise it's never happened. Why, you know, why do Constellation? Commercial partners can do it for cheaper. Why do the shuttle? Uh, Constellation can do it for cheaper and we can go further. Every time someone has said that, every time someone's pitched that uh, cost as a as a device for saving, we we haven't ended up with a less we haven't ended up with a cheaper solution. We ended up with a lesser solution. Does that make sense? And one could you could even make the argument that even with SpaceX, we still ended up as a lesser solution. This is not a Falcon 9. Falcon 9 cannot do what the shuttle can do. It can do a lot of things that the shuttle can do, but it can't do everything. See what I'm saying? You get what you pay for with space flight. Yep, that's right, Pure. That's why I know for a fact that it's always gonna be the case. Anybody that says they can do it for cheaper best have a robust plan for flying a lot because it doesn't matter what you make. It's always gonna be expensive. Space flight. The only thing that's gonna bring costs down is flying it more and maturing the technology. Then it will be cheaper. Which is why, like, even with SLS, get that EUS working, you know? We're actually a little shallow here. I'm gonna lower the pitch. We're gonna, I'm gonna lower the nose a little bit. We're gonna bank it out here. In your opinion, what costs more, R&D, Starship, or the shuttle? 
Starship is definitely more expensive than the shuttle. If you compared cost to cost, Sawyer. You know how I know? It does, it's gonna do more than the shuttle. Simple as that. Starship is a shuttle that can land on the moon. It's more expensive than the shuttle. Now, the one thing, like I said, is Elon will buck the trend because he'll try to he'll try to achieve a high flight rate, something the shuttle program tried to do, and then Challenger happened, and then they never tried to do it again. And then the thing ended up being expensive. Turns out when you have something like a 747 and you only fly it one one or two times a year, it gets expensive to operate. See what I'm saying? Will SLS Block 2 be more capable than Ares 5? It should be close to it, Squish. Does the AJ-10-190 use hypergolic fuel? I already told you that it did. Yep. Monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide. Bringing her in. Trim out that body flap. There we go. Give me some speed break action here, just a little bit. We're actually coming in a little bit short on this run. But uh, yeah, it should be good. I would hate to be the guy that has to drain the ohms engine after landing. Why? They're in scape suits. They're okay. Okay, we're coming in at Mach 2 here. Should be hearing some sonic booms at the uh, Herbal Space Center here. Gonna go out here, fly out over the pond, bring it around, come right in on 27. Anybody link this yet? I'm not sure. Yeah, we've seen that, Jax. I'm a little afraid of space out the air. If you say so. Wasn't part of the reason why they do the S-turns putting some of the energy into going side to side rather than lifting entry into a shallower, pro shallower profile. Yep. Try to stay hot as high as you can for as long as you can, Aqualex, and if you can do some turns up there, you're gonna minimize heating. Yeah, absolutely. Would you hear a boom at the Space Center? Yeah, absolutely. Isn't the shuttle off though? Isn't the shuttle off? I, I am not really sure what you mean. No, it's it's not it's not off. What it, what it, what, it, what does that mean? It's still flying through the air. Sonic booms don't come from the engines, dude. They come from the thing flying through the air. Yeah, Dino Sign, the, the the engine doesn't make the boom, dude. No no. It's flying through a fluid medium. Flying through the air. The the it's the air that makes the boom. Yeah. The shuttle makes sonic booms. In fact, my bit tip alert is the shuttle sonic booms that <laughs> Shuttle made twin sonic booms, or at least two of them were the most audible. Uh, don't get me wrong. There, when something flies through and breaks the sound barrier, it's making an infinite amount of sonic booms. There are just certain sonic booms that are 
um, that are more pronounced than others. In the case of the shuttle, the most audible twin sonic boom, the most audible, that's, that's the shuttle sonic boom. The most audible that you hear from the shuttle are the nose breaking the sound barrier and the tail breaking the sound barrier. That's why the first one is more, is louder than the second one, because it, there's, the nose is getting a lot more air than the tail is. Why not the wingtips? It could also be the wings. Don't like, like I said, the wings are also breaking the sound barrier and they do leave a boom, but the nose and the tail is what you hear. Boom test. Yep. Discovery, go at throttle up. That's the throttle up, Orion. Yeah, Dino Sun. It's aero. A aerodynamics is a weird thing to understand. Two seven Al Desert. I always fly long. Every time. I always go past KSC and slow down. Shuttle has brakes. As Adino sign noted, it does not have an engine. You can't go around. Ground altimeter is on, gear is coming. Gear is down. Speed brake. Control. Orbiter's on the rollout. I'd have to say she flies really good, man. That was a little bit of a shoddy approach on my part. I, I did, I S-turned for too long. We went too far that way. So when I did the heading alignment to come around, it had to be a little bit steeper or else we would have would have not ended it well. Set flap to zero position. Convoy one, wheel stop. We have wheel stop. Safing out control systems here. Control systems are safed. I need to walk around shaking everybody's hand, wouldn't you? Better than past Collins, this is the best flying shuttle I could make. Oh, the landing was spot on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make that look effortless. Ah, Caden, I've done it a lot. That's the only reason I make it look effortless, dude. I have crashed so many shuttles on this damn runway, dude. Give me the pen flip. Give me the pen flip. Yeah. It took a lot of trial and error to get to this point, dudes. It takes a lot of practice, but yep. Look at that. Man, she purdy. Hey, where'd you get that pretty little shuttle? How are the Bruins doing this year?
I watched them absolutely obliterate the Flyers last night. I did, RJ, yeah. Do I have a Bruins hat? Not here. You got smoked by the Bruins. The Bruins are 15 and two. From a Stars fan, you're welcome for your coach. Yeah, Jim is, uh, Jim, Jim, Jim is, Jim is okay. Yeah, he's good people. <sighs> the next garage break is scheduled for four o'clock play. You redeemed it. Will the Commander Artemis II shake everybody's hand after Orion's splashdown and recovery? I hope so. What's your opinion on Hampus Lindholm? Lindholm's pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. Looking like a great setup for a first round loss to the light the lightning. No! No, frick you. Florida Flo Okay, Florida's a lot of things. Florida does a lot of cool things, like fly those, flew for flo flew those for a long time. But I'll tell you, when I think of Florida, I don't think of hockey teams, alright? Shut up. Right? It's not cold there. It's not cold there. You guys think 60 degrees is cold. That ain't cold. No. You can't play hockey in Florida. It's artificial. Discovery. It's no artificial. Arrival. It's not real. It's not real. No, no, no. There should be an asterisk. There should be an asterisk because you, you have to artificially have ice. We just naturally have ice up here. How many comes of We won one in 2011. Is the Navy doing capsule recovery for Artemis or using a NASA contractor? Navy. Navy. Hell yeah. <laughs> for a Panthers ticket holder. No. No. <laughs> Actually, Aqualex, yeah, I'll show that. That's probably good to show. Yeah, check it out. So, guys, there's a lot of... There's a Schlieren image, yeah. See what I mean? Look at... All of these are sonic booms. See that? What do you hear? Boom, boom. Actually, it is the wings. Wings combined with the tail. Yeah, see that? Yeah, see, they, they converge. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I missed. I was mistaken. It's the wings. Those are the two that you hear the most. One and two. You can tell it's a bigger sonic boom, literally because of how big that the boundary layer is. Yeah, that's pretty rad. Yeah. But even then, inside of this, it's uh. It's, you're breaking the sound barrier an infinite amount of times, right? Because the reason, the reason why you're breaking it, like, theoretically an infinite amount of times is because all those air molecules are all breaking the sound barrier. So each one of those things is going to make a little bit of a pop, right? And there's millions of them going over the shuttle all at once, right? So it's, it's, sonic booms are, it's just audible. One, some are more audible than others, right? Yeah, you're, you're theoretically breaking it an infinite amount of times, <laughs> but yeah, that's uh, that's a pretty good, pretty good picture actually, Aqualux. That one's going into my book suppository, sir. The Texas School Book Suppository. That's what it's called, right? <laughs> uh, uh, what are you going to do with that book? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the hell they're doing to those kids down in Texas, but that does explain a lot. I'll tell you what.
I call it a different name, but sure. <laughs> Wreck. <laughs> abort! Abort! Pull the chute! Pull the ripcord! Ah! <laughs> Alright. Shall we build the robotic arm? Shall we? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> you, have no, you have no idea how hard I have to hold back. But you are a well-disciplined person in this stream wreck and, and did hold back. You have... You stared temptation in the face and said no. Praise the Lord and prep the ammunition. Wait, what? Is joke. All in good fun. We have fun here, yes. Very nice. Is this the Kerbida arm? Yes. Kerbida, yes. Famous province north of Kerbfrica. Dude, Monday's gonna be busy for you. NASA will stream Orion around the moon and then CS CRS launch later that day. Yep, yep, yep. So, Bandit, I have Monday teed up for one of those I'm not going to get anything done type of days. Yeah. Yeah, like... <laughs> like Tuesday, <laughs> I just, we really didn't get much done. I we did the gauge cluster thing, and then it was just Artemis for the rest of. <clears throat> yeah, that's a not getting anything done day, which is good. Which is good. I'm over here laughing. <laughs> you got the belly laughs going. The. Ah, uh, I'm holding back, you monster. That's good to know. Give me one second. Give me one second. ADD break. Let's go. it works and I'm not questioning it and it is orange so it does make sense oh yeah creeper yeah it got got a little scorched huh Wreck, uh, yes. <laughs> no, I haven't, Thomas, but... White, we need to... White, we need to, we, we need to sit here and acknowledge the red team. For being the absolute bamps walking next to 500,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen and 250,000 gallons of liquid oxygen and enough boom boom tubes to uh, make a low yield nuclear blast and just being like, what up? I'm gonna tighten this later. Yeah, those guys are cool, man. I'd love to talk to those dudes. 
Nah, I don't think they'd be. I don't think the crawler would be able to move the ML with those three dudes on it. I'm pretty sure it wouldn't. Pretty sure it wouldn't move. It would sink into the ground. The Chad Squad. Chad, Trent, and Billy. Yeah. What's that one called? Nice. Are we listening to the NASA, NASA Artemis brief? NASA? Nice. Are we listening to the NASA Artemis briefing at five? Boosters in the ditch. Yes, we are. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. And when I say, when I say that those boys are standing next to the pad, you, I don't know if you guys remember where the red team went, but look, dude, you know, the valves are like right over here. The, dude, there's the rocket. It's literally right there. See, see what I mean? Like those dudes are like right next to it. I'd be like, John, I, I, I don't know if I'd be scared. I'd probably, I'd probably be just more like, oh, wow. Man, if that thing pops, I don't need to worry about nothing because I ain't going to feel it. <laughs> so, all right, sweet, let's go. You know, like, if it pops, <laughs> all right, well, it's been fun, I guess. You know, like, that's, that's Chad, Trent, and Billy. That, there will be pain. You know, you ain't even you ain't even feeling it, man. If this thing popped right here, you ain't feeling that. They'd never find you. It'd be nothing to you. All right, sweet. Those are rainbirds right there, WD. Yeah, that's the sound suppressor. Light cigarette. I would not. That's gaseous oxygen right there. <laughs> Zombie man. I mean. It'd be a really good smoke for a second, and then it wouldn't be a good smoke at all like an EOD seeing, saying either I get it right or suddenly it's not my problem anymore yep 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 it's pretty it's pretty Chad tier and one of the guys actually is named Chad so Chad is the safety officer actually <laughs> uh, definitely see Thomas's message all right let's build this robotic arm Did they just walk by the camera? They did. They just walked by the camera. Hey, what up? <laughs> just walked by. That's awesome. I didn't see this. That's awesome, dude. <laughs> They're just like, hey, what up? We gotta go. Torqued it down. Let's get out of here. Wait, did they salute it? Hold on. Oh, no. He pointed at something. Looks like Trent pointed at something. I would have been like, boom. See you a little later, SLS, with your fine rear end. With your fine rear end, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, right. he probably is. He probably is, Payne. Yep. Hey, guys. Hey, guys, did you see that, that there's that rocket right there? Wow, that thing is pretty neat. That That's pretty cool. Getting the Chad to your joke on the regular? Oh, absolutely, dudes. Dude, that's such that's such a classy inadvertent shout out to all the people that put this thing together, you know. A lot of, dude, a lot of people a lot of people need to come together to get to get this thing to uh to do that. You can tell it's a rocket because of the way it is. Is this just all ascent? Oh, freaking sweet. Can we just go back over here? I'm dumb and I don't get why they don't need oxygen. Oxygen masks? What do you mean? Why, why don't they need oxygen masks? There's plenty of oxygen. It's right there. Oh, there's plenty of it. You know, there's plenty of oxygen right there. You, 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 so there might be even there might be even a little bit too much.
Nice. 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 And hydrogen too? No, no. Hydrogen goes and finds the purge flame. You don't want to vent gaseous hydrogen next to oxygen. That's a bad idea. Yeah, this is just gaseous oxygen. It's gox that's coming out of the... Um, uh, from the bleed lines. The low flow bleed lines from the engine. I just want to... I don't know why the, the orchestral Home Depot music works, but can we help, hang on? G give me, give me, give me one second. Give me one second. Give me one second. Where's booster ignition? Okay, thirty-five seconds. Let me just go over here. Cool. All right. So play this. Turn the music up. All right. When this gets to 16 seconds, we roll. The oxygen's a little cold, though, isn't it? That's eh, not bad. I wouldn't be going around like <laughs> trying to inhale it, but. Kestrel Home Depot song, and it works. The rocket's orange, so it makes sense. Okay. Okay. Now play it with the music relativity hat in the impulse video. You, you want, okay. You want, you want this? It kind of works. It kind of works. It, it kind of works. Yeah, JG. Pretty, pretty metal, isn't it? I know, right? It kind of works. Okay. Drop the brakes. What year is it? The bass drop. Glow sticks and laser beams. It kind of worked. It needs more of this. I gotta make sure we can. We gotta play royalty free stuff, guys, or else I'd be. Ah, uh, yeah. See, we can't. We can't do 1812 because even performances of 1812, despite being royalty free, performances are still copywritten because, yeah. Drop the bass! 
drop the bitch. Well, yeah. All right, sorry. Do you think it works with Countdown? It'll work with Countdown, sure, absolutely, but it's not a shuttle. I can't, I can't play Countdown with SLS. I'm not doing that. E even if we could play it on stream, I still wouldn't do it. Robotic arm time, let's go. Yeah, Rick. What? You're what? Quite right. You're bloody well right. You got a bloody right to say. Right. You're bloody well right. What? Quite right. Anyway. <clears throat> can you buy the rights to it? You, should, you can buy the rights. You can buy the licensing fee for any song. It's just. Yeah. Difficult. Wait, Rec, you like Super Tramp at all? Because if you don't like Super Tramp, then what, 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 isn't, isn't going to make any sense. All right. So, let me get the regular music back on. So, we need to build an RMS for this thing. Would you ever build something like Space Lab for the shuttle? With when I'm with this shuttle, I can do anything. I'm gonna outfit it in a way where we can do anything that the real one can do, Cody. Yeah. I've heard the name before, and that's about it. Uh, it's it's old people music, wreck. Don't worry about it. Hot, hot, rot. Has a need to paint the rocket red, not orange. Red goes faster. Yeah, but orange rocket good. EJ, are the SRBs used on Artemis the exact same design as those used on the shuttle? Pretty damn close. So, uh, surely, yeah, they are. Here. So the shuttle SRBs are a segmented solid rocket system. So, of course... Oh, Facebook. You know I love that. <laughs> so check it out. These are the SRBs that are on the space shuttle, or that flew on the space shuttle. They are a four-segment solid rocket motor. Why is it called four segments? Well, one, two, three, and four. You got four segments. You have your aft segment, aft mid, forward, mid, forward segment. The ones that fly on SLS are the exact same thing, but with five segments. You have aft segment, aft mid, Mid segment, forward, mid, forward segment. There's a there's another one of these right here. That's it. It's pretty much the exact same thing. Uh, now SLS's SRBs do not have a parachute. There's no pilot drogue. There's no main chute. Uh, and that's about it. Yeah, they didn't because SLS's SRBs aren't recoverable. Boosters. I'm nearly 30 and listen to pretty much anything past 1950s. I'm 34 and I like boomer music, so whatever. It's good music, man. I don't know what you want to hear. It's good music. Shuttle SRBs were recoverable, kiosk. Yeah, absolutely. They fished them out. After every flight. In fact, SLS's SRBs are left over from the shuttle program, just like the main engines are. Ah, boomer music. I like it. Do we know why they opted not to recover? Low... Was the fifth segment too much for the old shoots? No. Low frequency of flight, Hokey. Cost-saving measure. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Have you ever done a deep dive into Gateway's engine? The power and propulsion element? No. I mean, Hokey, to be fair, non-recoverable non SRBs with SLS makes sense. It does not make sense with the shuttle. Yeah, failures, I'm kind of with you on that one. 
My, the vast majority of my musical taste goes from like 1965 to 1995. Like that's the vast majority of it. I got the seasonal flu shot I'm making all over the place. Yep, yep. Now, Hokey, personally, I, I think SLS, even at four launches a year, still makes recovering the casings useful. But that would require a structured systems engineering plan with SLS, and that, uh... <laughs> I, I, that's all I'm gonna say about that. Isn't the Orion service engine left over from the shuttle? Yep. SLS uses SRB casings from the shuttle. Obviously, the shuttle three main engines. And then Orion service module has one of those. They're AJ-10 190s, Cody. They are, they are literally the same ones that flew on the shuttle. It is literally made out of shuttle parts. They also did that to save costs. But the... The shuttle engine one I actually understand, and the SRB one absolutely makes sense. I don't know why you would take a system that was previously recoverable and not make it recoverable. That part I don't really agree with, especially when it comes to the shuttle engines. Um, but it's okay. For a year, we aren't at that cadence at all. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's my opinion that they're going to it'll eventually bump to four a year um let me put it to you like this you want sustainable lunar presence two launches a year is not sustainable lunar presence that is the opposite of that um yeah that's the opposite of that four launches a year is sustainable lunar presence that is literally where we left off during the apollo program from basically 1969 to 1972, NASA was launching four Saturn Vs a year. Think about it. July 1969, Apollo 12. And they went all the way to Apollo 17 by 1972. So 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Six launches over three years. Well, actually, it's about three. It's three launches a year. It kind of that's what it sums out to. But 1969, 1970, they were... They were doing, yeah, three launches a year, which is fine. Three would be great. Three is enough for sustainable for sustainability if you wanted to reuse those SRBs. But, Hokey, there is a trick to that. There's a... Wasting all the shuttle casings. Wasting all the shuttle casings. Uh, gives them an excuse to build better, newer, better solids, and that's what we're getting from Northrop Grumman. We will, we will get a, uh, we will get a better, um, we'll get better SRBs that will increase SLS's payload capacity. Three would be rivaling the Apollo program wreck. I'd say one moonshot every three months is probably the most sustainable. Now, don't get me wrong, Phyllis. I'm talking about sustainability. Sustainability is oftentimes at odds with cost. What I'm proposing with four launches a year is not cheap. By any means. It's not, it's not, it's not cheap. All right, let's go look for some re reference material, material here for the R Space Shuttle RMS, the Remote Manipulator System, or Canada Arm for short. Ah, Shuttle Remote Ma Manipulator System, Mission Preparation and Operations. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay, yep, nope, nope. That's not what I'm looking for. Could lessons learned from the ISS habitation lead to long-term sustainable habitation modules for long-term lunar stays? That's really what Gateway is more about. Rarus, the ISS is learning how to live in space. Gateway is learning how to live in deep space. Two very different things. One's inside of the radiation belts, the other one isn't. So Gateway is going to be a big deal. We need that. And also, if you're going to build something like Gateway out in lunar orbit, you might as well explore the moon while you're there. That's kind of what they have teed up. 
Any part of Gateway built yet? It's being worked on right now, Kiosk, and the first two modules for Gateway are scheduled to fly out there on a Falcon Heavy in 2024. Yep, yep. You think they want to get rid of all the old shuttle casings to get a new SRV to be reusable? No. They want to get rid of all the casings because they could save money doing that. Or at least appear to save money. I would argue that it doesn't really matter. But those carbon casings, those carbon wound SRVs are a lot lighter. And they're stronger than the current SRVs. So you have lighter you have lighter boosters, right? Lighter, lighter boosters, more payload mass. You're shifting some of the mass from the mass of the SRB, and that's free. It's free payload mass for you, Jim. Can we name rename the RMS to Robotic Space Tentacle? No. No. Do you think the carbon ones could be recovered? They could, man. Yeah, sure. Why not? I mean, I, don't, I think I think they could be. But also, carbon... So sometimes when the SRBs came down, it did bend the steel a little bit, and they had to put the SRB casing in a giant turning rig to, to make it true again. I don't think you could do that with carbon with carbon SRBs. They are... Because they, car, carbon doesn't bend, it shatters. Right? So... Might have some problem reusing the bottom casing if they were going to do that, but I don't think they have reusability planned for those carbon SRBs. I was AFK. What flight rate would make sense for recovering SRBs? For the shuttle Aqualex with the steel casing SRBs, I would say once a month, a shuttle mission a month would be would be enough to where you would break break even on that because you're block buying everything um with sls four four flights four would do it i still think that sls is going to eventually get to four flights there there's patterns that i'm noticing guys and i don't want to say anything because you know like i'm a little little superstitious. I'm not superstitious, just a little stitious, you know what I mean? Uh, I don't want to jinx it, but I think SLS has a commercial partner. NASA's hinted that there's a there's somebody that wants to launch something commercial on SLS. I have no idea who or what. I can't figure it out. Like the only person that would have the like the money to buy an SLS launch is like Blue Origin or SpaceX or another government, I suppose. It's kind of, hmm. but yeah, it's just, I just keep seeing it with how NASA is going about soliciting stuff. It was you? Yeah. I want carbon cases. Watch carbon cases will start show, washing up in Fiji or something. Yeah. Lockheed Boeing, Northrop Grumman. It's possible. Yeah. No, it was me. The healthcare industry? Maybe. I mean, SLS could put, like, Blue Origin's orbital reef into space in, like, one shot. Like, if you wanted to do that, it could absolutely do it. Just... Space Force? I don't know, Snib. I... I the Space Force certainly has enough money, but why? Why would you... They have Falcon Heavy. They have Falcon Heavy with its extended payload fairing, and they have Vulcan. I, I can't imagine they would want to launch anything else that would constitute... That would constitute, like, needing, like, an 8-meter fairing. Because they're definitely not after... I don't think... If it was them, they wouldn't be after Block 1 SLS, right? Like, wouldn't be, that wouldn't be Block 1 SLS. That makes no sense. What are they going to do? What is the Space Force going to do? Was the Space Force going to put people in space? A, bra a military branch of government putting people in space is a no-no. That's, uh, very... That violates the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. That's, uh, not, not cool. Not cool. Yeah, that... I would have a big problem with that. So I don't think they're launching people if it was them. I don't... I don't think it is, though. It makes no sense. They would need a cargo variant, you know what I mean? Like, if they were going to use it, right? Like... Maybe they want an Orion satellite around the moon. Yeah. <laughs> 
DOD, after seeing the major success of Lofted, is looking forward to orbital supply deployment. Have faith. Interesting, Havix. Not people, supplies. Yeah. Mission control is a bit outdated. Oh, what? You don't like my 4x3 flat screens? All right. We got to find something here. Let's check modeling the space shuttle remote manipulator. Uh, that's the kinematics. No, no. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. This could give us something. All right. Okay. Hey, rocket guy. Two days outdated to be exact. <laughs> I see what you did there. Lockmart would need block 1B for MADV, so it could be them. Yeah, it's possible. All right. Let's go here. Space Shuttle Remote Manipulator System. I hate that it auto-populated that because it knew. All right, let's take a look. Oh, there's a basically the same exact picture. How are you gonna make the rotating latch mechanism on the arm? <laughs> I'm thinking. <laughs> Give me a second. All right. So. I'm getting some reference here, guys. That's what I'm. That's what I'm looking for. I need. To, I'm pretty sure I know how this works, but what we really need to do, and where what I really need to figure out is how I'm going to get this to work like this. You see, the robotic arm is designed to. If you look down here, and now don't get me wrong, I've done this in the past, but see that the the entirety of the arm is actually on a hinge. When the robotic arm is stowed, it actually folds down and then it rotates inward. That whole thing will rotate that way. It rotates the arms in so the payload bay doors can close. And then when the payload bay doors open, you, you the entire arm, which is like kind of tilted inward like this, can rotate out. And the other thing is a lot of people don't know is that the arm can go on both sides. It was possible for the shuttle to carry two remote manipulator systems with it. You could... You could have one and two, and then where this picture was taken, on the aft part of the flight deck, you could actually swap control between the left and right arm. Yeah, they had a singular control system that could control either arm, which is actually really, really freaking cool. It's another capability to shuttle that we put, that we paid for, that we never used. Okay. Wait, that shot had two arms, I think. No, no, no. That that shot is the ISS. That's Canada Arm 2. SSRMS, Space Station RMS. Um, yeah, they're building a third one for Gateway, by the way. If you're talking about... No, I know what picture. I know what picture you, you saw. Uh, this one right here. That's not a second robotic arm. That's the selfie stick. It's the Orbiter Boom Sensor Sweeper. Aqualux, and they mounted it in the second robotic arm spot. It's literally a selfie stick for the space shuttle. So it could, um, the arm could like reach back and they could take pictures of the thermal protection system. See this one, it has much more detailed diagrams. Okay. Uh, okay.
Thank you, Creeper. This is, yep, that is exactly what I'm looking for. See, the whole thing stowed. It, it can move into the stowed position so they can rotate into the payload bay. But we also got to make sure that whatever we build doesn't rotate into where the payload needs to go. It, we need to have it in a spot that's basically dead space for the payload. Fun fact, the company that built Canadarm went on to create the first surgery robots. Did those surgery robots do surgery on a grape? Yeah, see, look at, there's your maximum payload volume, right? And then that's the radiator and that's the payload bay door. See what I'm talking about? That whole thing tucks in together and they are riding very close to each other. Tuck, tuck. Yes, indeed. Yeah, that looks like that whole drive assembly. Uh, okay. Yep. Creeper, good call on this one. All right, so on our shuttle here. So we have a we have a little bit of a benefit in that we uh, do not have radiators, so we don't need to worry about that. Uh, Kerbal doesn't really put too much of an emphasis on radiators, so that's that's good. I just want to see something here, just while we're on a side note. Trying to see if we can get a little bit of part optimization here by uh, by setting these flags to not uh, to actual just flag, not panel. But yeah, it seems like yeah. You know what? Let's just let's just keep it the way that it is. So a lot of people have been asking me, are you gonna are you gonna fill this area in right here? The answer is yes, but we gotta figure out how we're gonna mount payloads in this thing. That's the other real important thing to understand. So this the Mark III payload bay is really, really designed for basically a 2.5 payload. Now, this 2.5 meter payload, just like on the real shuttle, doesn't sit down here. It doesn't sit at the bottom of the payload bay. It's it's kind of riding more or less like this. So if we close up the doors, that see what I'm talking about? This is going to be the tricky part. We don't have a lot of space. There's not a lot of extra space here to hold the arm in position. Now, we how my payload, how the payloads are going to work is I'm going to use Kraken Tech to hold them in position. Or well, hybrid tech if you really want to know. I'm going to have the latching pegs be these things. But because we're recovering the shuttle every time, dude, we don't necessarily need to worry about the payload bay, like putting an insane amount of hooks inside of the payload bay. I can just reconfigure it every time. Um, like, I'll configure it depending on what mission we're flying. But the other thing is that there, the modules for the shuttle are kind of hanging from the sides, but there's also a locator peg down at the bottom here, which is why I don't have, um, that's why I don't have, I, that's why I have open space down here. So the payload can actually ride in the payload bay like it's supposed to. That's why I left this area open. Hey, Jared. Shuttle for the win. Indeed. Actually, that needs to be basically right there. I'm not too worried about making slight modifications here because. Discovery, go at throttle up. I 
I'm not worried about making the modifications here because uh, this is not going to affect how the shuttle is going to fly. You know, hey Hawk, what's going on? Yeah, we're gonna need holders here, and then I need docking ports down here. The other thing that I'm going to do, which I probably think, it's probably a good idea to get into this habit. The other thing that we're gonna do is I'm going to get into the habit of marking with a flag center of mass on every single payload. That way, I have the shuttle center of mass right here. I have that already marked. That's the, that's the dry COM, so that's the center of mass with no fuel. We put payload, line up payload center of mass with dry center of mass on the shuttle. It should fly theoretically the same every time, except if we try to bring down 18 tons, in which case the thing comes in like a wrecking ball, but we can still get it back. But that, that really helps with uh, putting this whole thing together. You're going to do the whole space station freedom attachment method. Yeah. I don't see why we shouldn't, Aqualux. I mean, they, yeah, Cloud, they do that on air, they do that with airplanes, so why don't do that here, right? But see, one thing that I'm like, eh, about now is, do I bring these parts up? Do we bring these up to, I mean, because this is where the real shuttle had them. This is, the payloads didn't like fly down inside of the payload bay. They were basically up here. Uh, because down here is all the shuttle systems. There's like wiring and pipes and stuff down there. So these things are kind of flying like this. If that's where the shuttle had them, then that's where they belong. Amen to that. But that does constrict our payload size, Aqualex, for our modules to basically 2.5, and that's about it. I kind of want to have the clearance in here. Did you finish that payload pallet you were working on a while ago? Payload pallet. Huh? What? Uh. Yeah, I, Urban, it's right by the... Uh, progress on the project is... Yeah, yeah, no, Urban, pro progress is good. It, the project was completed. It's right over there in that circle by my stealth fighter. See see the stealth fighter right there? And the, the, the... How excited are you for KSP-2? Laser... Are you old enough to remember the end of the shuttle program and how much it sucked when the shuttle stopped flying? Picture the exact opposite of that. Sorry, was there a niner in there? Were you calling from a walkie-talkie? No, no, it was cord. Knew it, predictable. Yeah, yeah, you call me predictable, but did you predict this? Ha ha! Shut up! Ha ha ha! Ha ha! Now what, dick? Oh boy. Yeah, yeah, remember, yeah, chat, yeah. Remember the 90s? Yeah, okay. Laser, I'm, I'm ready to go. How about you, dude? I'm jonesing. I'm jonesing. I'm hangry. Hangry. 
top, man. I'm already dead. Age-wise, you're pretty close. Zinger. See, Aqualex, I'm kind of torn. I want these where they exactly where they were on the shuttle. But also, I don't have wiring, a big wiring harness or anything down, down here. I don't have a big wire harness. I don't have pipes. I don't need stringers. I don't need any of that stuff down here. So if I did move this to where they, where the inside of the payload bay should be, so theoretically that's right there. If I did move it where the payload bay should be, it's just a lot of wasted space in that payload bay. Wasn't clearance a real issue for the payload bay? Yeah. I mean, yeah, no. I'd rather have so much room for activities, dude. I'd, yeah, I'd rather have that weed, so... Even though it's not exactly right. Discovery, go at drop. Hey, Muffin, all caught up with the VODs in here for some building. All right. So, guys, yeah, you know what? I, th I figure we'll talk about payloads and how they're integrated. So, the shuttle had... The shuttle, I mean, we'll get back to building the RMS, but we got. it seems like we got to figure out the manipulator system on, on board. So, or not the manipulator system. you got to figure out the, the payload system. Now, I do know something about it. Um... The space shuttle basically had a pallet system, just like any other form of logistics. They had they had a pallet system, and they had space pallets, and that urban, that's what you're talking about. So the shuttle had basically that, the U-shaped thing, the pallets. So some of these pallets are like duds. They're just, if you wanted to just put something on it, you could just put something on it. Some of them have power. Some of them can even be deployed. In fact, uh, the German space program, in the, in the West German space program, I should say, in the 80s, and NASA came together to uh, build the shuttle pallet satellite. SPAS for short. Shuttle pallet satellite is exactly as the name implies. It's a satellite that's designed to work with the shuttle's payload base system, right? And it has RCS on it and it maneuvered away. The shuttle picked it up out of its payload bay, let it go, and they it flew around the shuttle, came back near the shuttle, they grabbed it and put it back in the payload bay and brought it brought it back down, which is really cool. It took some it took some really, really cool pictures of Challenger. Yeah. It took the first third person shots of the shuttle ever. Yeah. That's Challenger. In space, this is a picture that was taken from, from SPAS. To clarify my last, isn't that a point of having a bigger launch vehicle that it wasn't man-rated? Oh, I see what you're saying. The, ICSB, the ICPS deployed a CubeSat that's going to take pictures of it. That's cool. Yeah, that's it. I thought we had these ones before, but maybe it was an inspiration for something else. I think we looked at the hold down points on it. Yeah, the pins. Mm -hmm. I did do the pins, Urban, on um, on my last shuttle, but the payload bay system was not really designed for hybrid tech. I had a proto hybrid tech, but yeah, that's look at that picture. Oh man, yeah. See, there's a shuttle pallet right there. It's just triangulated, and you, you had a bolt point right here, and then you had latches on the sides. A locator pin in the center, and then the latching system was on the side. That was a pilot dowel, so to speak. How delightfully Canadian that they lend their neighbors a hand, even in space. Oh, yeah, bud. Oh, yeah, they're doing, yeah, they're doing really good. Yeah, look at that. That's really nice. So, I want to basically make the pallet system. Oh, look, people are doing it in Kerbal. <laughs> nice. Basically, they want to make the shuttle pallet. Shuttle pallet system. Uh, yeah, see. Did they load at the... Where did they load? You could do it in the... You could... Somebody asked it. You could load either in the... Uh, mobile, the mobile service structure. Or the rotating service structure. Or you could load in the uh, OPF. Either one. Shuttle could do horizontal or vertical... Vertical integration. Horizontal or vertical... 
integration, not interglacials. That's something different. So also you see the passive latch right there. Those are passive latches. Basically they're just locked in. And then there's an active latch right there. See, there's two different types. That's the active latch right there. Those are the ones that could deploy. See the active latches? Oh, those are more passive latches. But basically what I want to do is reconfigure the payload bay depending on what we're doing. Moon Palette was an inspiration for it, Chief. Yep. Nice. Well, here, have some references of the one here in the UK. Ah. Urban, I'm wondering if this is a uh, test article. If it's a test article of some sort, it doesn't look it doesn't look like a flight component. Did this thing fly into space? Is there any info on it? Because this thing is interesting. You have passive latching pins on the outside. And then you have your your locator down here, but there's another set on the interior part of this. You'll look into it. Yeah, I'm wondering if this is a uh, if this is a it's not necessarily a shuttle pallet. I'm wondering if this is a transport rig to carry payloads, like if it carries a pallet in here. This might be a transport. A transport pallet for moving sh space shuttle payloads around on the ground down here because this doesn't it might be because it's weathered because it's been outside because this might be a uh, trans uh, payload shuttle payload transporting equipment but that that is what a shuttle pallet looks like urban thank you for this picture yeah that that is what it looks like it's just a big U or if it's a space station module, it's the whole circle, you know? It's a UK space center, uh, the one at Lest Lester, yeah. yeah not sure, anyway. So, we need to... I'm going to keep that one open. That's the page for it. There's the Canadarm stuff. You can get rid of that. Yeah, see that? Hmm. Not sure. I need to... We need the pins for the latching system. Got to figure out how to do that. But yeah, Aqualux, I, I do kind of agree with you. Like, here, let me close the payload bay doors and try and figure this out. Yeah. We might. Any... Would there be any reason to look at your old system? Um, not really. We, it's, it's just thermal bearings with a latching mechanism and a docking port. So the payload is actually docked down here. So what I was thinking is, we have we can have a pilot pin down here, and then we can also put docking ports right here in the center of the payload bay down at the bottom 
And the reason why I left this open is because, you know, we can move the docking ports wherever, right? And if, you know, I line up this docking port, for instance, with the shuttle center of mass, when we recover the shuttle and bring it back into the hangar, I can reconfigure the payload bay by just moving a docking port around. Check Black Horse's last link. Let me... And that is this satellite cradle, actually made in the UK for use on the Space Shuttle Atlantis. Using it to launch an Intelsat satellite, commercial satellite that we're going to launch on the Atlantis mission. However, after the Challenger disaster, actually moved away from commercial satellites. So we have one of the 10 cradles built, I believe, actually on the site. And you can come and stand next to it and see just how big the satellite would have been and just how big the space shuttle would have been as well. It's a very cool, good picture opportunity there too. Oh yeah, that's another thing I forgot to mention. After, the, after Challenger, they, they said the shuttle shouldn't launch commercial payloads anymore. They they sold the aggregate space, but no 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 shuttle commercial missions. Which um, you know, let's just take the things that make the shuttle program cost effective and just you know not not do it. That's that's cool. Sure, sure. Why not? Yeah, you know, that's a good... The, you brought up a good point, dude, to be honest. You brought up a good point about, you know, why, why not? Like, why, why not just, you know, have the aggregate space? Actually, if... If I'm, you know, if I'm looking at this right, we don't go with the aggregate space. We don't need these vertical pieces anymore. I can literally just get rid of them and we could save some part count. Well, now we know why it sits in the rain. Yeah, I have a checkerboard flag that sits on the shuttle's dry center of mass. And I'm going to make sure I mark all my payloads that way too. So when, I'm, when we're out moving them in space, you know, I need to figure out, oh man, what's the center of mass for this thing? We can just kind of do it. Let's, uh, you know what, you know what we'll do? I'll take this and I will move this down once. Right there is where I want this to be. And then, that leaves me enough space to be able to put robotic arms and whatnot in here. So I think I think that's what I'm gonna do. And then if we need to launch something bigger than this, that well, that's why I have the other launch vehicle. That's why I have my uh, Ares Five direct SLS thing. And you know what? Because we don't need these parts anymore, I don't need the panels. But I still want to make I still want a tribute to panels. So. I will put a lone panel here on the back of the payload bay. We'll put a lone panel down. Actually, yeah, we'll put it right there. All right, get rid of that. And we don't need that. Now we know why it sits in the rain. Yep. There. That actually, that's kind of, that's cool. They actually, and we ended up, EJ, speak English, we actually ended up using less parts. And that that's good. Because these flags are actually parts. It's registering it as a part. It's not physics-less. So why the gap between the floors that you've added? 
long story short, Muffin, payload bay integration systems. You still going to change the Ares 5-1 to vectors? Haven't decided yet. So, Muffin, the reason why is, yeah, the shuttle's payload bay is riding up here. There's a lot of space down here on the real one because there's stringers, struts, there's wires, there's fuel cells, there's a bunch of stuff. Actually, I can actually end up moving these fuel cells up a little bit so they're all the way inside of the payload bay. That's not going to affect how the vehicle flies. Moving these up a little bit will, won't shift our center of mass in any particular direction. But yeah, there's fuel cells, there's COPVs, there's a bunch of stuff under here on the real shuttle payload bay. Um, yeah, so it's a little bit to make it more realistic and it's a little bit so I can fit the payload bay systems in here. It's And so the payload is riding where the actual payload rides in the shuttle. And honestly, moving these up means I didn't need the sidewall flags here, so I ended up saving a good amount of parts. And I needed this space anyway for latching systems and the remote manipulator system. Boosters of the digits. Yeah. It's Mapoko, anybody good at making transparent flags? Yeah, there's plenty of people here. You can learn how to do it too. It's not too bad. You gotta learn you gotta learn about what's called an alpha channel. The alpha channel is the, what gives you the transparency. So yeah, now we can I'm just curious, where does this thing ride otherwise? Yep. Okay. Yeah, see, my the payloads the payloads in reality ride way higher inside of the payload bay. And Aquawax brought up a pretty damn good point that he brought up a pretty dang dang good point in the fact that um look, I don't oh you know, the shuttle can't launch bigger, you can't launch a bigger payload. Oh no. It's not like I didn't design an SLS style vehicle to go with it with a gigantic 8.4 meter payload fairing. Well, mine's five meters, but you get the idea. Long story short, I need to launch bigger things. Just use, use, use my SLS direct Ares style rocket. How many times can NASA or SpaceX use a pad before they need to fix it? It depends on the rocket, Clayton. I have to wonder how much weight and copper wire we could save if we use double redundant IP style network with localized micro microcontrollers rather than cable bundles to centralize computers. Ah, that's a question that I don't know the answer to. <laughs> that's a question I don't know the answer to. So, uh, yeah. Those were some words that you said. I, I was... Those were words. I like your funny words, magic man. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Discovery, sure. Go at Boosters in it. What's up, Dizor? Yeah, right around there. We could also use these. And those are more pin-like, and they are physics-less. The problem is, is that I don't have any type of bearing for this thing. But I do like how they're more pin-styled. This is much more like the Space Shuttle Latch, but I'm kind of wondering, like... These are a little bit more delicate, 
than the RCS balls? Can they take the loads involved here before they shatter? Test time. Let's use the shut up craft file. Okay. All right, so let me take a look. Let's see if we can design some strong uh, some new hybrid tech here uh, we're gonna need the thermometers okay I need something to hold this pin in place. Just chill. Would you, would you relax? I'm trying to think. I got this. Relax. Hey, you in the back. You're getting crazy. Calm down. Calm down. I got this. You're freaking out. Don't freak out. I said, I said, don't, I said, don't, uh, uh yep, guys, I lost them. The heck is VSR three? <laughs> the heck is VSR three mean? I don't know what that means. I less than you two. Right. Bono. be a good part for this. I'm just trying to get a bunch of small parts that we could attach things to. VSR3, it does sound like a sound like a rice rocket, doesn't it? Oh, oh yeah, it's quiet. Oh, yeah, light bar. Yeah, we had those. So the first thing we need to figure out is the antenna's collider. 
All right, if we're gonna use this as a pin for our payloads here, we need to... Where does the antenna's collider stop? Okay, basically right there. And how thick is this thing? Ah, the collider is offset. Interesting. So see how I'm not selecting the antenna? My mouse isn't over it, but we're highlighting the antenna. The collider does go out there, but it's basically this shape. Objects use colliders in video games, or uh, if you play shooters, a hitbox. The hitbox is usually a lower resolution piece of geometry. It's done for optimization purposes because the geometry is still rendered, it's just not there. And sometimes when something moves around, like if an object is animated, because the hitbox hierarchically is parented to it, right? When you move, the hitbox kind of lags behind. You ever like shoot somebody and you're aiming over here and you end up hitting them in the face? Like you aim right here in a shooter? It's because the hitbox is lagging behind because it's parented to the model. Interesting, right? Sierra's 20 sli 26 slipped to Tuesday. Actually, to be to be very clear, that has to do with the network. The network not updating the the bot the hitbox position uh, fast enough. So you're kind of shooting where you the the last known location where your computer saw that person, and on their screen they could be further ahead. But desync between the computers means that you'll hit them even though you're shooting like right here. Counter Strike is notorious for that too. Counter Strike is notorious for no registers because on your screen it looks like you shot them dead in the face and they'll have a blood stain dead in the face, but you didn't get the hitbox. That's important to understand. The hitbox lags behind, and that's what makes really good shooting players versus really bad shooting players. You know that the hitbox is lagging a little bit behind, so you 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 off you learn to offset the shot. At least that's what I did with when I played uh when I played with the. Uh, when I played Counter-Strike with the AWP, with the, the sniper in Counter-Strike, I would always aim just a little bit to the left. Or if they, were, if they were moving this way, I would aim to the right. If they were moving this way, I would aim to the left. Reverse that because you guys are looking at me. And... Anyway, so, Clyder Box. We gotta figure out a way to make this work. So give me the thermometer and let's figure out what would be the best way to do this? Okay, so will that give us a pin? No, that's not even close. Where would this pin need to be? So let me rotate the thermometers around Ethernet. Curious, how can a cell phone CPU run something like the Space Shuttle or SLS? Um, it, it can, it could, Clayton, but it wouldn't work how you want. Okay, so computers that are on the space shuttle, Saturn V, any modern rocket or even aircraft are a little bit different types of chipsets than what you'd find in like a garden variety computer. Like, you could make your phone run it. It wouldn't run very well, though. Like, th this is provided you have a way to hook everything together and have them somehow communicate with each other. And hopefully, the aerospace software will somehow work on a regular processor. But lo long story short, the, the architecture, like the physical hardware, is different. Why is it different? Well... You know how they say that your cell phone is like a million times more powerful than the Apollo computer? Well, yeah, that's absolutely true. But 
The Apollo computer is not really designed to be too powerful. You don't need something incredibly powerful to move a rocket around in space. It doesn't need to have like a hex core in it or something. Like a calculator's processor is good enough. Like in terms of like clock speed. What avionics in hard, like computer hardware that's in rockets and airplanes flying nowadays is really good at doing is doing a lot of simple things really, 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 really fast. You can, the processing speed is not very high, but the amount of data that gets moved through that processor is very, very high, if that makes any sense. Computers aren't necessarily designed to do that. Now, don't get me wrong, a computer can do it. But think about like a, a guy flying the space shuttle, all those inputs to all those different control surfaces and all the subsystems that are on the space shuttle. That's a lot of things to manage all at once, right? So they, they're... The processes that you'd see on like an airplane or a spacecraft are, yeah, your phone has a more powerful processor, but those computers are very good at taking commands rapidly in real time because that's what you need to fly something. Does that make sense? Distributed parallel processing. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, trajectory. I mean, Ando, you know good and well. Computers can do calc really, really fast. Yeah, it's not too bad. What they what they ended up needing for something like the space shuttle is not something that has a tremendously high processing speed. Because the computer can do stuff quickly. It's getting the data to the computer and getting it out. So, like, with the shuttle, you have a guy that's controlling the flight stick, right? You have a pilot and commander, they're controlling the flight stick, they're controlling the body flat, they got the rudder pedals, right? And all the other systems that are on board the shuttle, all the control surfaces, you know, the speed brake, the body flap, you know, not to mention the computer monitoring all the systems on the vehicle, the fuel cells, the APUs, the HPUs, like there's so much stuff to manage all at once, right? All those inputs go into the computer and then they go to the control surfaces. It's, it goes through the computer. It's a fly-by-wire. That's what a fly-by-wire system is. I mean, having a computer control a vehicle is not that big of a deal, but having a computer be able to, in, to having high bandwidth for user input and high bandwidth for control output is something that where like the processor in your phone and the processor in an F-16 really diverge. Like that's where they, two different, two different branches, distantly related dude, but two different branches. So long story short, yeah. Could your cell phone run a spacecraft? Yeah, maybe. If you knew how to hook it up and get it, if you knew how to get them to talk to each other, sure. But if the crap hit the fan really, really, like if you had to do a lot of things all at once, like maybe a landing or something, cell phone would bog down. Oh yeah. There's no way you can, there's no way you can communicate fast enough. It's bound by the hardware. The processor is bound by the hardware it's attached to, right? I may have body flaps. That's... Weird. Okay. With technologies nowadays, I wonder if analog is still faster. Fly-by-wire is still analog hardware at the end, but a digital interface. Yep, yep. Basically GPU versus CPU. Eh. K kind of. Kind of. Yeah, it, it, those systems that are on plane, airplanes, spacecraft are designed to be able to handle a lot of different things. The, it's, it's the pipe, that it's the bandwidth that goes to and from the processor. It's really different than what you'd have on a computer because a computer doesn't need to do a lot of things in real time. It need to do a lot of things. Even if you're playing a game, it doesn't need to do a lot of things in real time. You know what I mean? Well, it's not weird. It's fat. I mean... Body, yeah. You're just big boned. You're just big boned. So, yeah, yes and no, dude. Yes and no is the right answer. Modern USBs have crazy high bandwidth. Bigger issue is real is the real-time requirement. Sure. CISC and RISC architectures, complex and reduced instruction set computer. First, uh, first have a lot of instructions and can do a lot of different things. Second can do some things, but very fast. Yeah, there you go. I, I don't, I forgot what the technical terms were for it, guys. So I tried to just explain it straight up. I, I forget what it's called. They're different. They're, it's literally a different chipset architecture. What, what you guys said. I think that statement is usually a power comparison. A cell phone CPU is stronger in operations per second 
than the CPU that ran the space shuttle, but it wasn't designed for flying the shuttle, so it will probably struggle. It'll get bogged down. It'll get bogged down. Like, your cell phone, your cell phone can do a lot of things, but anybody that has a phone and you have like 30 different apps open on the phone all at once knows that the cell phone doesn't matter how powerful it is it's still gonna get bogged down right like but yeah there there that's where like aerospace computing goes over here and like personal computing goes over here they're they diverge they diverged in the I don't know 70 late 70s But yeah, it's really cool stuff. Like you read about how different it is and yeah, it's really neat. Like um, AI day, Tesla's AI day a little, uh, a couple of weeks ago, they they introduced a different type of chipset that is designed for, their, their chipset basically removes the bandwidth restrictions between a GPU and a CPU. That's what they're, that's what those Tesla server racks are, are all about. Uh, if I understood that correctly, they're, they're basically trying to take a GPU and a CPU and sandwich them together. Like, get those components as close as you can to get a, the maximum amount of, like, I think it's 3D rendering. It, it is like a chipset that's optimized for graphics, which is really, really cool. Because they want to be able to recreate 3D worlds with the Tesla, Tesla Autopilot to train the Autopilot to make it better. They, they rapidly prototype in a 3D built environment. Uh, that was basically modeled by the cars driving around. The cars will take pictures and then they'll they'll build a 3D environment based off of that, which is unbelievably freaking cool. It's so it's so damn cool. But it's also fair to say that NASA sort of pushed forward computers. Absolutely, yeah, yeah absolutely, Gorthon. Yeah, no microprocessors. Uh, NASA didn't invent the microprocessor. That was around. Compute, but computers before the Apollo program took up an entire room. Think about it. Like even even some cutting edge computers in the '60s were still using tubes, tubes and transistors, vacuum tubes and transistors and stuff. And don't get me wrong, a CPU is just a bunch of transistors that's all kind of smushed together, right? That's basically what it is. I mean, it's a little more complicated than that, but you get the idea. Uh, but. Um, the Apollo program didn't invent computing. It, it didn't invent computing. It accelerated it. It, it. it, like, the miniaturization of digital processors is what NASA did because they needed a computer to be light enough to fly on a spaceship. So they took this computer that's the size of a freaking room, right? And they were able to smush it down enough to be able to get it light enough to put it on a spacecraft. That's the real innovation. And that's what kind of... The miniaturization of that tech, the miniaturization, the manufacturing techniques, all that other stuff is what sparked that personal PC revolution in the late 70s. It's, it, can, it, it is directly tied to it. Miniaturization of microprocessors. It's huge. It put us 20 years, 20 years ahead in terms of like where we should be. We went from fallout to the modern like compute, like modern computing in less than less than 10 years. Look up system on a chip or system on a module sometimes. It's what that Tesla chip basically is. It's cool, man. Basically, in RISC, to do a multiplication, you need to use multiple add shift bit instructions. On CISC, you just use MUL. So more instructions equals bigger instruction table. More time to process instruction by the CPU is more latency. Interesting. Yeah, it's crazy, Aqualux. It's nuts, dude. Nuts. Can we go back 20 years, please, and thank you? Yeah, it's kind of... It's it's absolutely insane, dude. It, it, like, the Apollo program is the reason why you have a phone like that. You did hear about that in the past. I wasn't sure if it was the real... Yeah, yeah. The cooling for the shuttle computer must have been insane. It's tied into the shuttle's radiators. Those radiator panels are as big as the shuttle's payload bay doors, T-Man. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Turns out it gets pretty hot. And the shuttle had four computers. Four quadruple redundant computers that are, uh, I, th I guess the modern way to say it would be four of these 
high, I'll call, I'll say high bandwidth processors, that's not the right name, but it had four of these things in the shuttle avionics bay and they check each other. So the modern equivalent would say that they're, they were in RAID. That's how you would say it nowadays. RAID is basically, you have four of the same hard drives and if you update one, it updates the other three. Three are just mirror drives of that one. That's a spacecraft pro spacecrafts do that all the time. They have multiple redundant computers because so like if you narrow down computing to like once again reduce it to its base concept. A computer computers just have transistors. You have choice, okay? So transistor what what makes a transistor ridiculous is that if you put them out if you put a certain amount of voltage into a transistor, the signal goes one way. If you put a certain amount of voltage into the if you put a different amount of voltage into this transistor, the signal goes the other way you have a three-way intersection here, okay? So that's why computers are ones and zeros, right? You have ones and zeros, you have left or right. The ability to make that choice, right, is like the one and the zero is a bit, okay? The ability to make that choice is why, why transistors are ridiculous. So the transistor is the reason why, and I probably didn't explain the transistor exactly right, but that's the idea. It's ones and zeros, right? So one is a left, two, zero is a right, okay? So those the, those little bits of information are just exactly what they're what I just said. It's a bit. In space, radiation can hit the data that's stored on like a hard drive or something and flip a bit. It'll flip it. So if you give the computer instructions and some radiation hit the hard drives, right? Where you wherever you're storing information, whatever medium you have to store information, right? It'll flip it. It'll flip the bit from one to a zero and it'll say take a right turn instead of taking a left turn. And you know if the GPS says take a left turn when you should take a right turn, you're going to wind up in Albuquerque. You know what I'm saying? You should take in the left at Albuquerque. That's why a lot of modern spacecraft, this shuttle included, have multiple computers. So if one of them gets one of them gets fried and says, hey, we need to turn left here. The four other, the three other passengers in the car, so to speak, say, no, that guy's an idiot. Don't listen to him. Turn right. Oh, yeah, turn right. Okay, cool. Yep. It's like it's like you have, Clayton. It's like you're driving the car around, right? <laughs> and you have you, in my my the rules of my car is whoever ride in right seat is the navigator. That's their job. If you take a wrong turn, it's their fault. But imagine you have you know people in the back seat. The person the person that's that's in the navigator's chair says, "Hey, turn right here," and the two other people in the back say, "No, turn left. That's not right. Don't listen to them. They're a terrible navigator. Screw them." That's exactly, that is exactly how the space shuttle's processors work. That's why there's four of them in redundancy. Hey, this doesn't look like the Carrot Festival. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, that's RAID, Gorthon. You can do this on a regular computer if you have multiple hard drives. You can have the hard drives in RAID. And you literally can have a quadruple redundant backup of your system, right? And if you change one on one hard drive, it'll change the information on all the others. That's what RAID is. Actually, RAID was developed from that technology, if I'm remembering correctly. Could be wrong. I'm not the best with computer hardware, guys. There are people here that are way that are way more knowledgeable than I am. But I'm confident enough in what I know to be able to explain it correctly. There was a fifth. Yep, there's a fifth redundant drive on top of the four. That's correct. Good job, Mr. Vaughn. That's right. You drove halfway across the country in the wrong direction. Yeah, it's HAL S. That's what the shuttle was coded in. Yep, yep. It was still being maintained as of 2005. Yikes. Yeah, flip bits occur down here all the time. That, If I'm remembering correctly, isn't that what a fragmented drive is? Or is that something different? That's something. No, I think that's something different. It could be wrong, though. Yeah, that's something different. Yeah, yeah, okay, cool. That's what I thought. Jax, what's this? SpaceX Director of Mission Management Sarah Walker says the company recently decided to build another Crew Dragon spacecraft, which will round out its fleet of eight Dragon capsules in total. Five crew, three cargo. Makes sense. ECC RAM is for that. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. This new capsule will have a serial of C213. Cool. 
It's a reason servers use ECC memory. Yep, yep. A fragmented drive is where you erase and save new information to the end of the disk and leave holes. Yeah. Oh, okay. I got you, nerd. Yeah, that makes sense. Bitflip is why you use ECC RAM in critical... Dude, I, you know what, dudes? I see why people dig this stuff. You know, like, servers and networking and stuff. That's actually, that's actually pretty cool. That scratches the itch for me. I can tell it scratches the itch for me just... Just by talking about it. Like, server farms and stuff? That's cool. That, that, dude, that, that makes me happy, like, seeing a bridge being built. It's the same... It scratches the same itch, dude. And I'm like super scared of that because like I know that that I know that that's a huge rabbit hole you like turtles turtles are good I've done I've built networks for people before Ando yeah the guy I built it was just hooking up some basic stuff like one rack dude. but yeah all the cable management and stuff and getting everything to communicate that's that's cool that's cool I dig it I think it's neat it, it definitely scratches the itch, and that's what I'm like, uh-oh. Uh, uh I don't know if I should do... I mean, don't know if we should keep doing this. <laughs> Data center engineering will blow your mind. There's no... Dude, there's no doubt. There's no doubt in my mind that it would, Rarest. Absolutely. Okay, so we need to test that this hinge is working correctly. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into mirror sim right here. And then we're going to absolute snap. Let's see how strong this hybrid tech could actually be. So... put these in here and then obviously what I want to do is go in here go into AG1 select these and aim, enable same vessel collision right and then what we'll do is give me a just to test this give me a hinge right and what I'm gonna do is take the hinge and I'm gonna snap the hinge and get the pivot of the hinge on the pivot point of this here so then I want to I want another physics list part down here and then I want these attached to there so absolute snap that and then take the pins take the pins and put them into position here let's see how much this thing can hold so I'm going to take Actually, we need to make sure that the pins are selected. Enable same vessel collision. There we go. Um, now what we'll do is I will put one of these here and put another clamp here. We're going to need a probe core. We don't need the lights there anymore. We don't need the flag. All right, um, I am gonna need a probe core, so I will just put, because we're testing something here, I'll just put that on there. It really, yeah, it's fine. Take this, run a grandparent there, take this, run a grandparent here. And what we will do is I'm going to get a fuel tank over here, right? That fuel tank is attached to the main part, right? This is attached to the, the clamps, basically. And we'll attach the clamps here, here, and here. Now, I'm going to take the same exact tank, take this, get rid of that, and we will put another set of struts right here to hold this in place for a second to make sure that the Kraken tech works correctly, like this. And then I'm going to move this up here back into position and then move these pins back down give me two of those give me six of those oh this is the worst looking hat i ever saw you buy a hat like this suppose you get a free bowl of soup oh it looks good on you though all right cool save this we'll put shut up out on the pad and we'll see what happens here most braid versions are actually cooler than making copies. They're spreading the data across as many drives in a pattern, and if some data goes missing, you can use the pattern to rebuild the missing data. Yeah, yeah, that's all over the place in aerospace engineering, yeah. I was an intern at a data storage facility that uses some legacy hard drives. We noticed that the alarm for the door lock causes the disks to disk inside to vibrate, which causes massive amount of latency spikes. Some awesome stuff. That's actually really cool. 
All right, so hit one, right? So let's move this hinge, right? Let's just give it a little bit of a swing. Okay, it's not gonna do anything because this is strutted. Now let's disconnect that and disconnect that. So now those thermometers are holding this thing in place. That thing would not be able to hold this up. There's no way. But this is acting as a as a bearing here. See, it's the six-sided star right there that's holding that thing in place. We should be able to just, yep, see? And then just get rid of that, get rid of the torque limiter. See? There we go. Okay, now, because it's still all one vehicle, now let's get crazy. Start loading the fuel in, see what happens. No movement. I would say that this is strong. Um, yeah, I would say that this type of bearing is a strong enough design. Just putting it out there. And now if we just dampen it out a little bit. Now, if I go in here, I'll show you what I'm getting at, dudes. We go in here, hit two, select the antenna, and hit disable same vessel collision. Watch, watch this. Those antennas, those little delicate freaking antennas are holding this thing up via, via same vessel collision. And because these are all physicsless parts, they don't drift, they don't bend, they don't flex. Because if I disable same vessel collision, this thing should sink right to the ground. Ready? Boop. See? That hinge is nowhere near strong enough to hold up nine tons of anything. But if we hit same vessel collision again, and then we time warp a little bit. Oh, no, it didn't zap it back into place. Here, let's move the fuel out. See if we can get these things back into position. Kiggy! 13 months, did you enjoy SLS? Bro. So we take all the weight off of it, right? It should move this back into position, more or less. We're still drifting a little bit, but if we re-enable vessel collision, it should pop the hinge right back into place. Now, we can reload all this up and it won't move anywhere. It'll just sit there. The reason why I need to see this and the reason why I'm testing this at all is because I want to see if I can use these antennas for pins to locate themselves in the shuttle's payload bay. That's basically what the real shuttle does. Now if we go back over here, move it out, and then just get the torque limiter, it'll just start moving around. What I'm basically trying to do is see exactly how these hinges move. Yeah, we bent everything when we turned same vessel collision off. See how it's riding? It's riding on the corner of the hinge. But this is also good for being able to see where the collider is as well. Yep. That's why, that's why I made this craft file in the first place. I'm trying to figure out a way to do this forever. Thank you, sir. This is what I call hybrid tech, Gupsy. Hybrid tech is insanely strong. It takes all the springiness of the hydraulics away. Yeah, any of the, you, you never notice that any of the robotic parts in this game, they're like, they weeble wobble around. It's very annoying. This makes stuff insanely strong. I'm kind of curious to see what we could hold up with this. Check my last for another cool computing thing. When things get really cool is with ECC memory. 
where they basically do the raid thing I talked about, but the memory, but with the memory chips on the stick. Cool, cool, cool. Oh, for making a VTOL, it's invaluable. Yep, yeah. Oh, it broke it. So, the space shuttle in its payload bay, the payloads have pins. See them right there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's pins everywhere. You can see that's how they move the payloads around. They pick them up by the pins. Those are really important to learn if we're gonna build the payload bay. There's pins right there holding that pallet in place. I need to figure out a comp compact design because if I can figure out a compact design for the pins, that means I can, that's more space for my robotic arm. Like, look, I mean, I'm that, there's no there's no scenario, Gupsy, where this thing can move or manipulate nine tons of anything. That hinge is dinky. It only has 50 kilonewtons of power. It's nothing. So using this system, how would you fit these pins into your cargo hold? Well, Kiki, I, I really needed to test if it would work before anything else. We gotta make sure it works. Um, now, this particular type of pin here um, that one, we can, I'll show you how we can use that. Um, <sighs> give me a second. I'm thinking again, I'm, because Kiki, that's really, I hadn't, the, the truth of the matter is, dude, is that I haven't figured that out yet. I was going to use RCS bearings, but I don't like how much space the RCS bearings take up, because it'll be harder to get a robotic arm in there. I don't like all the space that they take up. So I'm trying to see if we can use a smaller pin system. Plus, this is more of a pin, less a sphere. The RCS ball is a sphere. It's really good and really strong, but this is also pretty damn strong, too. So what we can do Hang on. I always like to <clears throat> get rid of the hollow fairing stuff because it's distracting. Whenever I load up a craft file, I really wish it, it would keep the state there but it's okay so for our dud payload here the pin Kiggy would be great for locating down here that would be perfect um,
Oh yeah, Sleep, you're gonna have a Canada arm there, bud. Oh yeah. All right, so that's basically the amount of space we have to work with. It can't really go any further than that because then it would be touching the payload base. So that's how much space we have to get this figured out. So, what I can do now, right, get something that I know works. We can take the no shut up craft file and then grab the hinge that we just designed. And literally shift left click, it'll pull it off and then get rid of it. Now we have it. Right, so down here, I ain't too worried about that. That'll line up almost perfect. And this actually gives us some space down here to make to make this work correctly, which is actually pretty cool. And yeah. Yeah, that's actually really good. What? You have no idea how much Oh, sorry. My bad. Yeah. Really really good trick. That's where it needs to go. See, this is why I left this area nice and open. Because now we have our bottom locator hinges. That's that's good. We got the bottom locator hinges here. And yeah, very nice. So we can take that. Enable SVI. Take that. Enable SVI. That's all perfect. So, and then, you know, we could put a docking port. You can take the docking port, put the other docking port here. Right, and then just take the payload out. If the shuttle was still flying, I wonder what kind of pallets we would still have. We would have good ones. Okay. So, you know, we latch the docking port like this, and then... We can move that into position to line up. And if, you know, if we take this payload and we move it a little bit lower, just a teeny weeny bit, might be able to squeeze it in. Yeah. Something I just thought of today. Open, uh, Tranquility Base here. Nukes Green Rock. Uh, it's a seasonal reminder of the best power solution man has ever invented. Oh boy. An accompanying, an accompanying, accompanying, an infographic to go with it. My brain do good more. That's dumb. 
Forge. I didn't look at the whole thing. I'm just gonna say it's dumb. It doesn't look very smart, but anyway. What's that? Impressive. The vast majority of each Dragon Council should be able to capable of 15 missions with the possibility of more frequently changing out some soft goods like parachutes and other components. Original certification was for five flights per vehicle. Sweet. Train man, before I check this infographic, let's see. Something I just thought of today. After they had to redesign the shuttle SRBs, what happened to all the other old casings? Scrapped museums. There's one sitting in front of Pima. A two, two O-ring SRB design. Most of them they sent back and they just... They they retooled them. Some of them were scrapped. It really depends. Honestly, wouldn't be surprised if there was a proposal to use uh, an SDLV. I mean, Train Man, it's another reason why something like SLS should have been just designed with the shuttle from the start. It, it, it would have made sense. Uh, you know... Nuclear SRBs. Yeah, hard pass. How many turkeys can a nuclear reactor cook on Thanksgiving? If an average electric oven uses 2,400 watts of electricity to cook medium on medium to high temperatures, a typical Thanksgiving Day turkey weighs 15 pounds and cooks for three and a half hours and feeds 12 people. Well, the average nuclear reactor generates about 1.21 gigawatts! Then, that's enough power to cook more than 2.5 million turkeys in three and a half hours, which could feed every person in 18 U.S. states. That's 30 million people. Yeah. Yeah, nuclear power, man. Ain't no power like nuclear power. At least populous states, to be fair. I mean, it's still, th 30 million people is 30 million people. How many turkeys per watt? Uh, I don't think that matters if it's nuke or an electric oven heating it, but uh, yes, turkeys per what? 2,400 watts per 15 pounds. So, turkey's 15 pounds, yeah, 2,400. Would the turkey get irradi get radiated from it? If it's a nuclear power plant, no, you're not, you're not putting a turkey in the reactor. <laughs> Don't put turkeys in nuclear reactors. That's not a bad. It's not a good way to. It's not. It's not a good thing. It's a pretty bad idea. That is not a good way to. That is not a good way to cook your turkey. Do not put the bird in the reactor. Don't do that. Don't put. Don't do it. <laughs> Mom, my turkey is glowing. Yeah, it's called bird bird rank off radiation. Wait, is it glowing blue or is it glowing green? There's a difference. I saw wishbones on the ground. You saw nothing. You didn't see that turkey because it isn't there. Get this man to the Turk firmery. Get this man Thanksgiving dinner. Yellow cake. Yep. Guy got some yellow cake. Are you sure it was yellow cake? Yes, I'm sure, chat. He bought some yellow cake. Look, I got it wrapped up in this special CIA napkin right here. Don't drop that stuff. Don't drop it. Pray to God you don't drop that stuff. What? It's funny. Shut up. It's funny. All right. Instructions unclear. Stuck. N yeah, don't, don't, don't finish. The, don't. Yeah, don't, don't do that. <laughs> you dropped it. I am ashamed in you. Firework. I'm ashamed. What's going on? I mean, how far does the radiation from the reactor go? Uh, it, 
T-Man, I'm... I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that you don't really know how a nuclear reactor works. Am I, am I on the right track? Am I on the right track? Like, it's okay to admit. I, I'll, I admit when I don't know stuff all the time. Yeah. Yeah, so in a nuclear reactor, with like a modern nuclear reactor design, you don't really, the radiation doesn't go anywhere. Um, long story short, how they do this, they, uh, they submerge the nuke in a giant pool of water. And that water gets the crap irradiated out of it. Yeah, but water, just like water is really good at absorbing heat, right? You know, you spray a lot of water on the pad, it protects the pad and the rocket, right? Like for a sound suppressor, right? Water is very good at absorbing radiation. It's very good at it. And it's really, it's really good at uh, taking away some of the heat from the reactor too. That's kind of the point. But uh, so T-Man, what a nuclear reactor does is it takes this water, right? And they pass coolant through the water. Not like through, they, like they pass coolant through and it heats it up and it turns it to steam. It heats the coolant, turns it into steam, that steam drives a turbine, that turbine generates electricity. And then it goes back into the reactor. But the rea there's like a reactor pool, right? That the nuke is stored in and that, the radiation doesn't go anywhere. I mean, that was a very, 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 very general, generalized nuclear reactor, but that's the idea. They're, 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 you don't want the freedom getting out of that thing. Yeah, but see, here's the thing. Even when a nuke is off, you still have to contain the contain the radiation because nuclear material doesn't just stop generating heat. Even if you have a nuke off, you still have to circulate the coolant. That's really important to understand. Yeah, radiation is really, 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 really good at, uh, or water is really, really good at stopping radiation. It absorbs it very nicely. It, in nuclear physics, it's it's a it's what's called a moderator. Uh, so a moderator in nuclear physics is basically you stop you stop the radiation for the most part. Um, it's and that's not necessarily it doesn't necessarily stop the radiation. That's not the right way to say it. Uh, a moderator regulates the amount of neutron flux that you get. What's neutron flux? So radioactive materials just like shooting neutrons out, like uranium, like shooting neutrons everywhere. What happens is that neutron hits another atom, and when it hits the atom, it knocks those neutrons out of that atom. Like, um, like if you if you you break uh, like a pool ball, like you you know you play in pool, you shoot the white ball at the the triangle of balls. They all go everywhere. Like that. Basically, that white ball is one neutron and all the pool balls are other neutrons and then it knocks them everywhere and those hit more atoms and those hit more atoms and those hit more atoms, right? When when that, na they, basically atoms are naturally splitting. They split atoms, that's what neutrons do. That's what they mean when they say, oh, the atomic bomb split the atom. That's what they're talking about. You knock the neutron away from an atom and the resulting thing generates heat, lots of heat. Turns out that if you super heat nuclear material really 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 fast uh you can cause a really really crazy chain reaction and that that releases a lot of heat all at once and because you're releasing a lot of heat all at once it creates a pressure wave just like the srb is igniting and that pressure wave is the nuclear blast yeah that's what kills you if the heat didn't already i mean but yeah yeah, nuclear material is really cool, but on a nuclear reactor, T-Man, it doesn't, the radiation is designed to not go everywhere. And they have a coolant loop for the coolant loop to make sure that none of that radioactive water goes anywhere. Yeah, the radiation should not go very far. Prefer they didn't release wastewater into Cape Cod Bay. Pilgrim Power didn't release wastewater. Al Desert, it's a BWR reactor. I should know. I actually kind of live close to it nowadays. <laughs> That's another story. Uh, Pilgrim Power never released wastewater like that. They never did that. What they did do is release... They, so, nuclear reactors have a redundant coolant loop. So, you have... 
the here I, I explained it very generally before. Here's technically how it works. Your reactor pool is not your coolant water. Okay? The reactor pool stays the reactor pool. You did that's that's different. Okay? So basically they run a coolant loop through the reactor and that heats up the coolant, right? Okay? And then that heats up a water loop. Okay? And that water loop is what they use to spin the turbines. And then that hot water, after it's spun the turbines, they either pump it into the ocean and use ocean water for cooling, like what Pilgrim Power did, or they have those big honking cooling towers to cool the water. But it's a double, it's a double cooling loop. Basically, the, the radioactive stuff, the stuff that's going that picks up the heat from the reactor, that coolant loop stays isolated. It's a closed loop system. That is attached to an open loop cooling system. Uh, but in some nuclear reactor design, designs, it's a closed loop system too. Yeah. In some nuclear reactors, they literally have a gigantic air conditioner plugged into the nuke to keep that the second cooling loop, the one that should be open, they keep that closed with a big freaking air conditioner. Yeah, T-Man, see Aqualex's link if you want to learn more. Hot off the press from Relativity. Terran's, Terran 1's stage mating operations are complete. Cool. There's local talk about releasing some kind of waste. Ugh. I'll drink the water that they are putting in your bay. Yeah, John, I'm right there with you. I mean, it's salt water. They use salt water to... I'm talking, yeah, there's molten salt and stuff, I cookie, and I know about those, like thorium and whatever. Uh, that's not what we're talking about. I'm talking about like a regular BWR reactor. That is a weird expansion ratio, Forge, for sure. Oh, that's cool, Spraz, yeah. The open loop cools the closed loop. Yep, pretty much. Yep, it's it's two redundant heat loops. One's open, one's closed. That's all. I say that like that's some simple thing to do. Nukes are no joke. You don't screw around with those things unless you really know what you're doing. It's one of those things that gets ridiculously complicated, like like this thing right here. There are also exotic reactors like those used in nuclear subs. I don't, yes, Raz, I know that they have some type of reactor in there. I have no idea what it does, and frankly, I don't want to know, because if you know, they're going to put you on a list. I don't want to know. Yeah, I'll stay, I'll stay willfully ignorant on that one. I don't need to. Yeah, don't, I don't really talk submarines too much, because, uh, you think rockets are regulated with what you can and can't talk about? Don't talk about submarines. That's a bad idea. They're, they are amazing pieces of tech. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Nerva instead of water, I'm guessing they use hydrogen. You're not guessing that, team man Don't lie. I've told you how a Nerva works before. Don't try to play stupid. I, I've, told, I've explained to you how a Nerva works before. Who are you trying to fool, boy? What do you mean you guessed? Oh, yeah, you guessed. I told you that like a month ago. Let's just get that fusion sorted out. Can we talk about submarine sandwiches? Huggy, you're on a list now. They're pressurized water reactors. Yep. Yep. Just nod and smile. Classified meatball sub. Now I'm hungry. And I've gotten I've got no damn freaking robotic arm done. Why? <laughs> Why chat? Why you do this?
It's literally a giant heap up sandwich with nuclear. Ah! ah, ah. Ooh, ooh. I don't know. I know nothing. I know nothing. I see nothing. I know nothing. Streamer says, "Don't talk about this." Chat. Allow me to talk about this. Th 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 thanks. Just shut up. Just shut up. Allow myself to introduce myself. Yay, yeah, and I saw it. Mm -hmm. We as humanity just keep making fancier ways to make steam. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, that seems about right. Not using the old arm as a starting point? No. Nah, I'm, I'm good. Will you be using a cal controller for this arm? Uh, uh. Yes? In some ways, Nephilim, yeah. Holy shnikes, Orion is getting close. Hey, but a bit? Yep. Yeah, I retweeted that a little bit earlier, Aiden. Yep, yep. Now I'm thinking how we could cool a nuclear reactor in space if there's no water. Last video of the week, how are we doing on the RMS? It's, uh, it's getting there, Weed. I had to, you were right, I, I really had to go figure out payload-based stuff, and I think I got something good happening here. It's not entirely fleshed out, but yeah. Does this gift work for your mission control background needs? No, it doesn't. 404 not found, man. <laughs> no. Off topic, what is next week's schedule looking like? Streaming Monday and Tuesday, John, and that's it. I'm driving to Detroit, man. Taking taking the rest of the week off, you know what I'm saying? You know Detroit? Hopefully you have a good turkey day in Detroit. Yeah, man. 
Okay, try it now. No, I don't wanna. No. Any any type of gift that has that player, like the, the play button at the bottom, doesn't work because it doesn't repeat. Posted a link on Twitter that you may like. It's not an actual rocket though, okay? Uh, all right. Sleep. Yeah, shoulder pitch joint. Okay. So let's just figure out the kinematics. Like, let's figure out how this stuff moves. I'm pretty sure we need... I'm gonna set traverse rate to like one on everything. This stuff should not move very fast. So we got our rotation there. That's... There's gotta be some rotational constraints here. Yeah, just set it to zero. It's fine. Then we have the elbow pitch joint. What the thin flat rotation servo be strong in boosters and division. Um, yeah, Creeper, this is what I used on my last one. You remember, these things don't need to be super strong. What I'm really worried about is them getting held, them holding up, holding themselves up in the payload bay. That's really, that's really the constraint that I'm like, uh, about. I think I got a way to figure this out though. I need to basically make a tray. I need to basically make a tray. See this uh, MPM, the upper arm MPN thing? I need to make a tray for these things that holds this arm so when the shuttle comes back down it's not just flipping out you know we'll use some hybrid tech to do it and if we do this right if we do this right i shouldn't have to put like a docking port on where the end effector needs to be like to hold this thing in place like i did with the other shuttle what i can do is basically make a ring of thermometers right you make a ring of thermometers or something and then the arm moves into position, right? And then like take the upper three thermometers and toggle same vessel collision on those, right? And then move the arm into position and then reactivate same vessel collision and it'll lock it in place. You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm trying to do. I think that is the best way to do this. I just finished my master's thesis and passed it. Damn, dude. Congratulations. Hey, Daryl was just psyched that it that it flew, Spraz. I don't hold that against him. I probably wouldn't have been able to say anything straight. At least the, the next thing that, you know, he delivered. We rise together. It's pretty rad. You know, because you know he's thinking about it. You know, he's like, oh my god. No, dude. Daryl, if you ever see this, dude. You did just fine. Frick everybody else. You just excited as we were. It's all good, man. Boosters and ignition. I mean, you guys got to go back. Uh, you know, it's funny. You know, everybody says, oh, man, you know, you didn't say it right. You know, et cetera, et cetera, right? And uh, if you go back to the Apollo 4 launch... When Walter Cronkite was covering that, I don't know, it's probably some people that watch the stream that were around for that. He freaks out too. 
My god, the building is shaking. Look, look at that rocket go! Oh yeah, he did the same thing. <laughs> it's, it's almost like first time you see a new he super heavy launch vehicle fly, you don't really have the right words. My god, the building is shaking. Look, look at the rocket go! <laughs> he couldn't, he couldn't freaking <laughs> to say, like, I don't know what to do. That. And that's, that's Walter Cronkite. That guy was a ext an extremely good journalist and newscaster. Like, he was the best. My master's thesis was on design education. Interesting. Did the first shuttle mission do too? Yes. I heard Daryl had a hot mic earlier in the broadcast. He was talking about the hydrogen leak with the mic queued on. It was also supposed to be one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Yep. Boosters and ignition. Yep. Yep. It happens, man. Rockets make your brain do weird things. This is your brain. This is your brain on boosters and ignition. Any questions? Payload bay door drive system. This is the limiter switch for the shuttle payload bay doors. This isn't exactly what I'm looking for, but this is still really freaking interesting. There's the actuator design. I love that you can just look this stuff up. It's so damn cool. Yeah, that's the door latching mechanism. Oh, interesting. That's the centerline latch actuator system. goes the robotic arm. Good. I'm learning a ton about it actually right now. Wow. They had a manual. Well, it's a manual. Yeah, they, there's a manual drive limiter that's attached to it, Aqualux. But check this out, dude. The limit switches are geared to the road to, to the center line actuator so all you have to do is turn on these drive motors and they use differential gear ratios to not only move the hooks into position but to latch them as well that's that's freaking cool man that's the limit switches are if i'm looking at this right Yeah, there's just an axle built into the payload bay door. It's just a drive shaft that's going through the payload bay. Payload, pay, the payload bay door, and it just hooks it into place. It's so, it's so damn smart, dude. Oh my goodness, all of this was driven off of two motors and you could manually crank it. Who the frick thought of this? Who the frick thought of this? That's freaking genius. Two motors, two motors. Un unlock the whole thing, open up the payload bay doors. Two motors, that's it. They don't move very fast, team man. NASA engineers, that's who. The latch actuator, payload bay door latch actuator, bulkhead latch actuator schematic. Look, two motors. I, I'm wondering if that's the same motors. I wonder if they had the same motor drive mechanism do all of this. It doesn't look like it. It's triple redundant by those, there's the two motors and then there's a hand crank. You could hand crank it. Now my question is where the heck do you hand crank it from?
Oh, that's so goddamn smart. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah, yeah, I remember when Scott talked about the contingencies. Yeah, the hand cranks at the back of the payload bay. And if it didn't if it failed to latch, they'd have some guy back there hand cranking during re-entry, right? I remember Scott did a video about that. Which is just like <laughs> You're, you're going to do what? <laughs> what? Yeah, this is the this is the radiator system. All right, that's a cool PDF. I'm going to hold on to that one. We'll keep that one open. We'll save it for later. I've been saving this one for a rainy day. Old tricks are the best tricks, Braz. Payload bay door, radiator panel familiarization, microgravity environment of Columbia during STS-32, Payload bay door closing at PCR pad B. No, not interested. A review of the Space Shuttle payload bay liftoff flight data analysis comparisons. Payload analysis for Space Shuttle applications. Payload system operations analysis. Okay. Technical cost analysis that was performed for payload system operations analysis is presented. <laughs> Scanning. <sighs> Not bad. Discovery, go at throttle up. Hey, Bio. No, that's not what we're looking for. Payload Operation Center. Nope. Payload Bay Magnetic Fields, Payload Bay Atmospheric Vent Airflow Testing, Operations Considerations, and Space Station Freedom Assembly. That might be useful some future down the road. Environmental monitoring the orbiter payload bay and orbiter processing facilities. STS-2, the second space shuttle, so, shuttle to carry scientific payload. Nope. Flight operations training for crew and support personnel. In-flight operations training for payload. Payload utilization for SLS. Oh, that's kind of cool. Alright. 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 The ISS is getting add-ons. Oh, that's not a robotic arm. Oh, please. Pause. 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 We had a space station called Freedom? Yeah. We were gonna build a space station called Freedom, which was like twice the size of the ISS, and then they uh, they said, "We oh, we don't have the budget to do that here. Build build something with the Russians as a consolation prize." And that gave us the ISS, which is still cool, but cost a buck oh five. We yeah, that's right. I'd say it cost at least a buck oh five. Unfortunately, a lot of the building that I do in Kerbal is a lot of just looking around here.
I'm just scanning. I'm looking for anything about payload bay operations. All right. Yeah. Nope. Contamination aspects of shuttle payload integration. Our view of the Space Shuttle Payload Bay liftoff flight data analysis comparisons. Divine development and integration of a Space Shuttle Orbiter Bay 13 payload carrier. Vibroacoustics. All right. Let's go into the flight operations manual. I've seen it, Penta. Penta, you remember? Remember a little while back? I don't know, maybe it was like 2018 or 2019 or something. I think you were here for this conversation. I had a conversation about when I asked chat about what crypto is and I basically said, oh, so it's money laundering. It's a way to wash your money. That's that's the end of the conversation. That's 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 all. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's uh, uh, you know, Chad explained to me how it works, and I'm like, this sounds like money laundering, and they're like, no, 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 it's no, no, it's not that at all, EJ. I'm like, this sounds like money laundering, man. <laughs> Money, this sounds like money laundering with extra steps. <laughs> I was like, I, 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 I'm not sold on it, bros. <laughs> I'm not sold on it. EVA, galley, GNC, landing, lighting, MPS, OMS, ODS. Yeah, S Master, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, part of it is what it is, dudes. I'm not. Uh, I don't want to. I don't really want to talk about it. But also, you know, what I'm saying, let's find. Let's find this payload bay. We got to find the payload bay stuff. Entry, orbit, orbit operations 5.3-1, ATO, TAL, RTLS, contingency, failures, well, failure, orbit. Terminal area energy management and approach. Okay, you know what? Payload bay. Wait, go up. Mm -hmm.
Okay, they're talking about the airlock there. I'm just looking for anything on the latching system. Here we go. What do we got here? Uh, Bay 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ah, uh, there. It's split up into 13 segments. And the segments are on the bulkheads. Didn't know that. And once again, dudes, I've read through this manual before. <laughs> Just never. There's, okay, so there's camera locations. There's four cameras on each corner of the payload bay for operations. And it's connected to a CCT, CT, CCTV system that was wired into the flight deck. I do know that. There's the floodlight control. Ah, yes, St video stream encoding. Very nice. After the payload bay doors are open, the KU band antenna is deployed. Yeah, that's right. That's the speaker. Center, center, center. It's closed circuit, Blinga, but yeah. Power reactant storage and distribution system. Cryogen okay, that's the fuel cells. It's underneath the payload bay. Ours are underneath the payload bay. That's where our fuel cells are. They're in bay one, bay two, and bay three. Yep, three fuel cells. Up to five tank sets can be installed in the mid fuselage under the payload bay liner. Interesting. Remote manipulator system, Sun, Ten Sun Temple. There's your fuel cell operations panel there. I'm just looking for anything about the dang payload bay. Fuel cell operating modes. There's your fuel cell fuel cell schematic right there. No. Pressure control system for the O2N2 control valve. Wait, what is this? What's this PCS for? I'm looking for operations, dude. Like how the RMS works and stuff and how payloads get put in the payload bay. I thought it'd be in the shuttle ops manual, but this is more about actually operating the shuttle. I mean, I, it's not anything I didn't know. It's, I mean, there's kind of, oh wait, what was that? What was that? There's the radiators, but that does give you a good shot about of, of the arm and what it does and where it is, which is kind of useful. I need something like this, but with payload bay operations. That's the radiator deploying systems. Freon radiation isolation valves. No, no, no. Cabin vent pyros are an ignition source in the payload bay and should not be used for post-landing egress. Oh, yeah, okay. I'll make sure to not do that. I'm kind of shocked that that actually has to be mentioned. Safer. That's the safer unit. There's the lighting system. Can you link this PDF? It's the shuttle operations manual. Yeah how to operate the space shuttle. This is the full thing, it's 1100 pages. All right, Aqua, let's just do it.
I thought Safer never flew on the shuttle or ISS. seem to be on the right track here. Let's just scroll around in here and see what we can see. Interesting. That's the latching end effector right there. Oh man, this thing is cool. RMS retention mechanism. Oh, there's a jettison mechanism, so you could you if the if the arm broke, you could just get rid of it. Cool. Ah, here we go. Bingo. Payload retention mechanisms. Here it is. Okay, so we got a motor that's driving a latch. That's it. And then you have a bridge pin that fits in the bay slot right there. And the bridge pins hold this frame on top and it's attached to a longeron. Okay. Okay, ah, very nice. Here we go. That's an active latch right there. Uh, okay, by those. I was going to say, that boy ain't right, boy. I'll tell you what. I think, uh, I think we found what we're looking for right here. That's what I need. This thing. This thing. Yeah. Yes. Bingo. All right, dudes. It's 4:30. We have an we have an Artemis update and presentation at 5. I found what I need. It's page 702 of the operations manual. I'm going to leave that open, and what we're going to do now is take a break. I think I found the section that I'm looking for. Oil time, change your hat first. Yep. Let's get the oil changed on that truck, see if we can seal up that drain pan gasket. Put the, put on, put the SpaceX hat on to do the oil. How long is the presentation? Don't know. I don't know. Sleepy, I thought all of this would have been streamed. But yeah, we, we can get into the operations here, guys. And I can even, you know what we could do? We could put cow controllers in here and have the RMS. I could even mimic their control systems, NASA's control systems with the RMS. We could do that. If we bound it to hotkeys and stuff. You know, we'll, we could control.